is here. When we're done with the first one, I'll have to just introduce Monica and his fiscal officer, okay. and we can go back to the others, because he has to head over to fiscal. Uh, good morning, everybody. I hope everybody got some rest from last night. Um, the announcement for this meeting started with House Bill 1237, but I'm going to change the order. We're going to start with House Bill 1288 due to a time commitment. And the prime sponsor, 1288, wasn't able to be with us last week. Therefore, she, uh, Representative McGuire is here this morning. Representative McGuire. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I'm Carol McGuire, uh, Allenstown, Epsom, and Pittsfield. And House Bill 1288 cleaned, started just to clean up some language that got inadvertently left out of a bill last year. And while EDNA had it, we added, at the request of the commissioner, some minor rearrangement of titles and clarification and update of job duties. And we added, we increased the amount of the non-lapsing revolving fund. Uh, Commissioner Arlinghouse explained it to the committee. The only detail that I remember clearly is that this fund used to be half supplied by agency uh, funds and half from the general fund. So it made sense general fund. However, that was stopped. It's now entirely funded from agency funds for training their people, and therefore the amount should be larger because there is no general funds in it. Okay. And, and of course, there's always inflation and stuff like that to deal with. And if you have questions about the amount of the fund, I have Commissioner Arlinghouse here to answer them. Okay. Thank you. Um, Representative McGuire, uh, anybody have a question other than the amount? Representative Almy? Yeah. Other than the amount, and I'm delighted uh, that the director's here, just in, commissioner's here, just in case uh, you don't know this. What happened when you reorganized uh, the divisions? What happened to dedicated funds? This was the only fund that was affected. We didn't. No, 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 I'm sorry. I don't mean about uh, the money in the fund. I mean the reporting of the dedicated funds. They used to be in. I'm sorry. We didn't go into that, and I'm not really aware of the details. Thank you. Um, Any further questions? If not, um, if, if the commissioner would come up. <clears throat> Hi, I'm, for the record, I'm Charlie Arlinghouse. Um, of Canterbury, I guess we do towns, um, from the Department of Administrative Services. The dedicated funds question. Um, nothing's happened to dedicated funds. Right. So, we, so it's important to note this. Nothing's actually being reorganized. The title of one of the divisions is changing. The division that we used to call financial data management, because they not just the, not just the financial side. You know, if you think of the ERP, it's multiple modules the state computer system. Um, and so what they do is not really manage financial data. They manage the whole kit and caboodle. And so whole kit and caboodle didn't sound that official. So it's, um, so we worked the word enterprise in. So that's actually literally the only reorg that happened. But I just, just Follow to up. make sure I understand. So uh, when we want to find dedicated, the dedicated funds reporting from now on, it will be under the division of enterprise applications management? Uh, typically, in our operation as accounting services, Dana calls the comptroller and, uh, and Matt Johnson, who's the new Tim Hartshorn on her staff, are typically who do all of that work. And I think we, we put the dedicated funds report on that division's website, accounting services. Accounting services. Accounting services, yes. <laughs> it's rather Any? hard to find. Are you all set, Representative Elmy? Yes, thank you. Uh, Representative Bromley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Arlinghouse. I uh, just want to make sure no general funds in this. Is this self-feeding from what feeds it? What kind of things? Feed uh, it? So the, 
So the Bureau of Education and Training, which is part of DOP, uh, the Division of Personnel, um, used to be funded 50% general funds and 50% tuition payments, which comes from agencies, so it could easily be general funds, uh, agencies in cities and towns. In the last phase, uh, the governor's budget director in the last budget process um, said that we could either eliminate it or make it entirely self-funded through tuition payments. And so it's funded through tuition payments. It's why we want to retain the tuition payments that cross the fiscal year line. Um, and so the lion's share of it comes from agency funds, and they could be general funds. But when we get them, they stop being general funds. And, and that's the reason for raising it to 100000 Yeah, so um, when, it, when you're 50% generally funded, you know, I, I don't want to say that nobody cares, but at the end of of the year, you know, you, you, some of the money goes away. It's just not a big deal. But when, when you have to eat what you kill, so to speak, yep. um, we need to roll it over. Good. That explains it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you for having me. Anybody else have any information they'd like to share with the committee dealing with House Bill 1288? Thank you. Then I'm going to close the public hearing on House uh, and the work session on House Bill 1288. Okay, before we go on, this is a question to committee members. And the question to the committee members, does any member of the committee have a problem if we go into executive session to pass this bill? If you do, raise your hand. Then we're going to go into executive session on House Bill 1288. Representative Almey, do you have a motion? Second. Representative Almey moves I ought to pass on House Bill 1288, second by Representative Romney. Any other dis discussion, questions? Seeing none, I'm going to ask the clerk to call the vote on House Bill 1288. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The motion is ought to pass. The bill is 1288. We'll begin the voting with Representative Abrami. Yes. No vote. Representative Griffin. Or Olivery or Doucette. Representative Lang. Yes. The clerk votes yes. Representative Janigian. Yes. Representative Nunes. Yes. Representative Spilsbury. Yes. Representative Tudor. Uh, Representative Aaron. Yes. Representative Almy. Yes. Representative yes. Ames. Yes. Representative Malloy. Yes. The Honorable Representative Thomas C. Schomburg. Yes, Mr. Clerk. Thank you, sir. Representative Tucker. Yes. Representative Gomarlo. Yes. Representative Lofman. Yes. Representative Hacken Phillips. Yes. Representative Murphy. Yes. Chairman Major. Yes. With the vote being 17 to nothing, the motion of ought to pass passes. And without objection, it will appear on consent. 
I see no objection, so it'll be on consent calendar. switch to just for a short while to House Bill 1598. We have the Commissioner Malakoff here. And, uh, and, CFO. and the CFO. Tina? Morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. For the record, I'm Joseph Malika, Chairman of the New Hampshire Wicker Commission, and with me is our CFO, Tina Demir. And can you bring the mic closer to you? Certainly. Is that better? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, if you give your names again. Sure. For the record, I'm Joseph Mollick. I'm the chairman of the New Hampshire Liquor Commission, and with me is our CFO, Tina Demiers. Okay. And again, I'll say good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Well, good morning. Yeah. Yeah. Representative Bromney. Uh, thank you both for being here. Um, Thank you. Thanks so, for having us. So uh, we handed out last meeting your analysis of, of where you thought the revenues would come in. And those included, the, the math there included edibles. It's just one big issue we have to, we're addressing here. Is edibles going to be in this bill or not? And then, but this morning you handed me, and it, for everybody it's in the packet, the green, the green folder. Um, Kind of next to the last document, there's a map of the United States, um, which is a different cut at this. Their, their estimates came in at 50. This is a work session, so I'm going to be a little more, right? Right, this is so, a work session. So the, their estimates originally came in around 50 million ish on the average. Um, the Marijuana Commission number came in about the same, about 50 million. Um, we have another document that was handed out from another bill, uh, 237, which was a full commercialization bill that uh, came in at, we got to add two numbers, it was, they, they, th that bill called for taxation at the wholesale level, at the, at the grower level, and then the taxation at the retail level. So when you add the two together, it was around uh, 20 million to uh, call it 35 million, and that's a, and, and and this all depends on what tax rate you want to use, and these were based at pretty low tax rates, and I think, and this was Rennie Cushing's bill, uh, rep, uh, uh, the late Rennie Cushing, and the, he I think in this bill he purposely picked low rates um, uh, of taxation, so that that's the range that was. That we are so, so we're in the ballpark, somewhere in, in the 40 million to 50 million, maybe 60 million, but, you know, every any way you look at this, there's different cuts at this. It's certainly not 200 million, okay. It's not 300 million in terms of the net, and all the numbers that is quoted included edibles. Your numbers included edibles. Now, the, the new piece of information um, is this document, and I'm going to. Look at you, Tina, and help us out with this. It's in your folders. Good morning. Um, I was doing some further research and found um, the Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy. And in reviewing this, um, found that the numbers support the 50 million that we were originally looking at. So if you look at the first map where it talks New Hampshire, it's giving you a projection of what New Hampshire would look like um, based on the Was Washington model and the protection. 
Um, these numbers were back from 2019. So if you look at the sheet that we provided um, previously in our fiscal note, you'll see that Washington um, came in, um, I think it's on the second, which page was it? On the second page on the bottom, Washington um, came in at 480 and the projections that we had before were um, right in line. So we were just using this as for further support to show how we originally did our estimates on a per capita basis to how the um, institute was looking at the taxation per state. And, and that was with edibles? Correct. Okay. That's correct. And our bill does not have edibles, but only edibles associated with medical, a medical card. Questions from the committee, Representative Almy. Thank you. Um, this ITAP sheet, this of a new tax is raised in your state. Were these done before they started getting their data in? Um, this was from 2019. Yeah. So even though they said could, they were basing it on what they'd already seen. Yes. And, uh, and you said that it was Rep a Representative Brown, a 39 percent taxation rate, which is pretty high, actually. Yes. So, so this would be kind of a really high number That's using their model. Right. Correct. That's why the number is 71 million versus right. the 50 that right. we were looking right. at, which was right. around the 20 percent. Okay. Mr. Chair, can I Go um, continue? Okay. So that, that's that's the revenue. Uh, there's more discussion. We'll have more discussion on revenues as we go on here today, because right. uh, that's the whole. I mean, main, the main enchilada in our discussions is what, what's, what's the revenue going to be? Yeah. Um, so just for the, since you're here, uh, Commissioner, uh, you envision, just, just give the committee a sense of what you envision in terms of stores and their locations and their, uh, they're going to be storefronts, that kind of thing. Sure. I, uh, thank you. Uh, well, what we'd like to see, first and foremost, I'd like to, to reiterate and reinforce that the Liquor Commission is neutral on this bill. And uh, we were asked to do a fiscal note, and we did a fiscal note to the best of our ability. Obviously, we run an $800 million business. We know a little bit about retail and profits and enforcement. And I think, uh, quite frankly, we're happy that we had the opportunity to do it. What I would like to see is a separate branding a separate fr uh, freestanding store. I don't think that this, uh, you know, originally this was, there was some uh, talk of this being in the liquor stores. We never felt that that was a good idea. These should be uh, separately branded in stores that are separate. Uh, we would follow our model because our model works. Uh, we would place the stores uh, with like-minded retailers uh, and retailers of volume. Obviously, 50% of our business in our uh, retail liquor sales comes from cross-border. We would expect to have the lowest prices in New England because there would not be a tax structure tied to it like there is in many other states. And in Massachusetts, for instance, the excise tax on uh, cannabis overtook the excise tax in liquor in year two. So uh, there's no uh, mistaking that Massachusetts is successful and their, uh, their tax revenue uh, shows it. Uh, we, would, we would run our stores, t for lack of a better way to put it, we'd run it much like a jewelry store. You'd go into a store, there'd be a small space, probably nothing larger than 3,500 or 4,000 square feet, including the back room. Everything would be put in cases. There wouldn't be anything out for people to um, come in contact with. So you're going into a, you know, a K Jewelers or any jewelry store, things are in cases, the product is in the cases. The employees would need to uh, come up to speed as far as education and sales are concerned of the product. Uh, part of our uh, repertoire that we had asked for would to be included would be a negotiant, much like in the wine business, there's wine negotiants. They educate, uh, they educate the consumers, they educate the people that work in the stores to the product, how the product is sold, the effects of the product. Uh, we feel that that would be a good model for us to follow because 
Obviously, we're successful retailers and, and we do a large amount of volume, but we're not in the cannabis business, so we'd want to be brought up to speed on that. And uh, we'd like to place the stores uh, on the borders, to be quite frank about it. Uh, we we want to, the 10 stores would take a period of time. Uh, we were asked to do 10. We thought 10 would be the best way. It could be more stores in the future. Uh, but the, the model of, uh, as we spoke to this morning, the model of stores in place were, were in agreement with that. And uh, I don't know what else I can, I, I can add for you. Uh, Representative Bronny, uh, talking about the stores, so in the bill, as it came to us, is an opt-out cla uh, clause for the uh, towns. Mm -hmm. Now, many towns are going to miss that opt-out, first off, you know, um, and talking to the municipal, they think it'd be better if it was an opt-in, but that's another discussion. Um, but, but I just want to ask you, when it comes to your liquor stores, do you have any, are there provisions where a town has a say whether we place a liquor store in their town or not, or city? No. All right. There's, so this there's will be a little bit different. That so, to that. So, so there's no restriction on the liquor part of their, what they, of their business, but in this bill we're allowing towns to say, no, we don't want a cannabis store or any, any cannabis operation, whether it's growing or manufacturing or retail. So that's just something for the committee to keep in mind, uh, that there may be some towns that are just going to uh, opt out um, of it. So I just wanted to, while you were here, to ask you that question about, and I had, that was one in the back of my mind, I've been meaning to ask somebody about that. So you have no problem with the liquor store, uh, liquor, liquor placement. Um, but then, do you, do you think, do you think it'll be harder for you to place to get strip malls or wherever to agree to have storefronts turned into stores to sell cannabis than liquor? Uh, if we were looking at this five years ago, I'd say yes, it, it probably would have been. But I think in, you know, in today's world, in today's retail world, this is certainly something that's become much more acceptable. Obviously, we're the only state, we're kind of an island, we're the only state that doesn't do it. Uh, everybody around us does. And uh, I know that Maine has a different model. Uh, the towns actually uh, individually charge for licenses of retail. And some towns are very high and some towns are much less. So I think there might be uh, an opportunity for the towns here if they wanted to do an individual type of license and charge the state. There might be uh, there might be some sort of uh, incentive for the towns to be able to do that, but I don't think in today's retail market I think it's much more acceptable. I think that consumers are much more accepting of it, and uh, my my biggest thing originally with this and looking at it is I didn't want it to cross lines between our liquor consumers right. and our cannabis consumers because there's certainly folks that come into our liquor stores now that uh, would be turned off by it. And we have a lot of, obviously in the highway, we have a lot of families that come into our stores. We have people that come through, you know, they buy, they buy the, their children a hot chocolate out front and, and they get a sandwich and then they come into our liquor store as a family. And I'd, we wouldn't want, obviously, to turn anybody off by doing that. So I think having the stores separate is key. And as far as the towns are concerned, I mean, we would abide by whatever the towns wanted. Uh, obviously, we're, we're not in the business to be contentious in any way, either with our stores or with, with these potential cannabis stores. And we're at the point now with our brand and our model where uh, we have more towns than want us than not. So I'm hoping that in the future that we would see the same with this. I have one, I have one more question. Oh, let, let, oh I, can, I can hold my question. You want me to ask it? Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. So, talking about cross-border sales, 
obviously it's illegal to buy marijuana in New Hampshire and take it back to Massachusetts. Understood. So I, I would imagine that would curtail, it wouldn't be a good look, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it wouldn't be a good look for New Hampshire to be advertising in, New, in, in uh, Massachusetts mm -hmm. the way you do for liquor because liquor is legal, uh, yeah. you know. So uh, can you just speak to that real quick? And well, that would be my our, last question. Our, as far as the advertising campaign and what we would do, that wouldn't be part of our campaign, and it w certainly wouldn't be something that takes place uh, as far as an advertising is concerned. Uh, but, you know, I drive down the Mass Pike as anyone else does, and uh, you know, you're inundated with billboards pretty much throughout New England as to cannabis being sold in whatever state you're in, obviously other than New Hampshire. And if you visit any of the stores in Massachusetts uh, or Maine, uh, much like our stores have a lot of uh, out-of-state plates, those locations have a lot of out-of-state plates as well. So as far as the law is concerned, I, I'm certainly sure that we're going to abide by the letter of the law. However, I think there's some personal rights involved here that we would, you know, you don't go out and check license plates at liquor stores, and I think this would be the same, and it would be difficult to do uh, at cannabis stores. I, I would agree with you on that. I mean, it's just going to happen. Yeah. Right. Right. Thank you. Representative Ames. I, I beg your pardon, Representative Ames, put on your microphone. Oh, sorry. You. I'll start over. Thank you. Let's see if this works, okay? Um, much better. Much better. Yeah. Okay, I'll start over. Thank You're working you, with a wholesale market in liquor that is worldwide and highly varied in terms of uh, uh, offerings of product. Yes. And... Uh, that's what you're used to working with. You're very adept at finding a uh, good product uh, that will work in terms of the market you're trying to market to and uh, selling that product and making uh, a good profit. Uh, we do our best. Thank you. Well, we appreciate it. Um, now we're talking about cannabis. And as per the discussion a moment ago, <coughs> uh, Essentially, your wholesale market, your product market, is confined to, confined to New Hampshire. Uh, very, very different. It's also right. not as varied a product. I mean, surely there are attempts to create variety, to attract consumers, to establish niches, and so forth. But uh, it's, it's really very different from what you're used to. How do you see that affecting uh, your ability to uh, to become the sort of the premier, the place to go to for buying cannabis? Well, I, th I think one of the things that we looked at and one of the things that we thought about was, uh, you know, obviously New Hampshire has been forever known as an agricultural state. We have a lot of family farms, small farms, uh, one acre, two acre. And in some of these facilities that I've personally visited in Maine are not much more than that and producing a large amount of cannabis. I believe there's uh, 650 growers in the state of Maine now and they cannot keep up with the amount of cannabis that's being sold. Uh, so one of the things that I, uh, when I, one of the things that I think that we're if, if we decide, if you decide to get involved in this business, is this, is this could be an agricultural windfall for the state of New Hampshire. This could be an agricultural windfall for all these small farms and small family plots that could get licensed and could sell. Now, could they could have one crop a year or they could have five crops a year, depending on how much money they want to put into it. But uh, rather than selling, or along with selling, some tomatoes and cucumbers and pumpkins out front, this could, this could turn into uh, 
a real windfall that for these folks that in some respects have suffered over the years. Uh, so I, I don't see it being, I actually see it being uh, an enhancement and, and something that could help people in the state. And I think that there would be a lot more people that are willing to grow than we might think. Okay, follow up? Follow up. Um, I agree, I agree, agree with that sentiment. Uh, the bill has a limit to cultivator licenses right now of 15. Does that make sense to you? No, it does not. I think that would be a mistake. Yeah. Okay, um, may I? Follow uh, up? Thank you. Uh, so, sort of on another front, the, uh, the model that you've built on is actually not in this legislation, is a roughly 10 store, uh, let's call it start. Um, in contrast, in Massachusetts, they've got more than 350 retail outlets. In uh, Maine, they've got about 75, I think. Uh, Vermont's just starting, so we don't know. Uh, but lots, lots of places to go to all over those states. Um, Fort, uh, 10 is, is very, very different. It's consistent with the liquor approach, although I don't know exactly how many outlets you have. Uh, but Just uh, under 70. At the, we're, we're opening three new ones at this point. So we'll be just at 70. Yeah, okay. At um, one point, we did so, have 80. So is this going to work? with 10 stores? I think that the 10 stores representative is, uh, was, a, was a starting point for us. I think that they'll, in the future, need to be more stores. I think that uh, depending on the model and the financing model that comes out of this committee, uh, we'll, we'll be able to look at that and, and make our decisions. But I think 10 stores is an opportunity for us to get into the business uh, and, and be competitive and be highly competitive and then look at future offerings as the public demands it. And, and, and much like in the, the liquor business, uh, you know, consumers tell us where they want our stores to be for the most part. Yeah. I mean, obviously with like-minded retailers of Market Baskets and Shaw's and Hannaford's and you know, I think that the consumers will, will let us know. We're going to, part of our model would be to strategically place them throughout the state, all over the state, the original 10, and then fill in as we, as we go along. Okay. And depending on the model of financing, obviously the more money that we can roll back into the business, the more stores we can add, and the success would be greater. Just one more follow-up, sorry. Follow-up. Um, so, uh, if we start at that level, it makes sense to start small. Oh, this is new. Um, would that affect our revenues? In other words, we, we're going to start low. Um, as we're going to have to finance that startup because, you know, we don't, it's your stores. It's the state's stores. Yes, uh, we're going to have to pay for it. Um, so we start small with 10 and build up. Um, that suggests to me that we, if we anticipate a revenue level up here of say seventy million dollars, um, we're not going to get there for a while. That's correct. I think that that would take a period of time, and you know, uh, anyone that knows me or knows Tina knows that we're very conservative in our numbers. I'd rather uh, surprise you with success than disappoint you with failure. Uh, so that's how we're. That's how we're looking at this, and that's how we look at everything that we do. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Representative Nunes, followed by Representative Elmi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you both for being here today. Uh, we are very anxious to hear more from you today. Um, I just have a clarifying uh, question. Uh, you talked about a monetary incentive for towns. For Is this monetary for retail startup to the towns, or is this uh, about revenue generated in the towns because the stores would be there. Can you uh, elaborate on what you meant by that? Sure. I, I think there would be a little bit of both, but I, f I, I know that some of the states have a model of by town. If the towns choose to allow it, 
there's a benefit to them because they would give the retailer, the, the liquor commission, the state, a license to operate in that town. So there's the incentive for the town to not opt out. So, and in and, and, and some towns, I've known it to be as high as $50,000, and in some towns, I've known it to be as low as $2,500, depending on the town and the state, so. Representative Alney. Thank you. Uh, I'm afraid I don't have the benefit of having been in the group that was was figuring out questions. Uh, but the first one is you, in the fiscal note, put your expenses in doing this, uh, and on do you still stand by those same ones or? Would you be revising them? And you're talking about the startup costs and then the operating costs. We'd stand by. Yeah. Okay. As I, as we've said, Representative, we we tend to be conservative in that approach. Uh, yeah. I think that the numbers that we looked at per square footage of developing these stores and developing this brand. I know that we had asked for some additional money to advertise. Uh, if, if, that's not the, uh, if that's not the wish of the committee, then we look at it differently and we, and we move forward accordingly. Well, I, I've got a couple of separate questions, but could I have a follow-up to that follow one? Follow-up. I understood that it would be illegal to advertise because the feds might come down on that? Are they, but they are advertising, it sounds like, in, the state. in, in, in the state. their, the other states. Yes. So. Uh, I mean, it's amazing to take a ride out the Mass Pike, quite frankly, when you, when you get beyond, when you get beyond uh, Worcester and, 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 and even some spots between Boston and, and Worcester and Framingham, but the billboards are incredible. The amount of money that the state of Massachusetts is spending to advertise cannabis, I, I, I don't know what the actual number is, but it's got to be a staggering number. Those billboards are not cheap. Thank you. And, and the second question is, first you said that the 10 stores were only going to be on the borders to outcompete our neighbors which leaves the entire interior of the state unserved when an awful lot of them are trying to get access right now. Well, I think one of the things we looked at was, obviously we don't want any community or any part of the state to go unserved should you decide to do this. And we would look at that, uh, when, when I say on the borders, I don't mean necessarily on the border of West Lebanon or on the border of, of, you know, in Salem. I mean where consumers can get to the stores and they're uh, associated with other retailers. So do I see some being in border towns, Rochester, Keene, Nashua, Salem, Portsmouth? West Lebanon. West <laughs> Lebanon. Yeah, I do right? because you know, there are two towns right We fish where the, the fish are. have just said they'll do it. <laughs> but did you have another question? Yes, I did. Um, and this one, okay, I'll remember that, I hope. Uh, this other one on, I'm really concerned about. On, in my experience, what, and I, I don't smoke marijuana, I can't get anything out of smoking marijuana. And so it was easy to make that decision a long time ago. Uh, but I do know that the people who do smoke marijuana care deeply about the quality of it. It's not, it's not a s simple thing to grow marijuana and keep it consistent in quality. And most, I think most of the places that are growing it are growing it in factory farms, essentially. They're growing it 
inside under controlled conditions with controlled soil and et cetera, et cetera. And then they have a product that they, they more or less guarantee. Uh, if we go to doing it on people's back lots, a lot of different people, how are we gonna control the quality? Well, I think just like any market, the, the, the market te tells you what the quality should be and obviously the quantity of growers should be. But I certainly, from a, from a business perspective, don't feel that limiting the amount of licenses is the right thing to do because then we're only serving the few. I think that the piece that we had put in, put in there to have a negotiant, someone who has the expertise in the field, to go out to investigate what's being grown, how it's being grown, where it's being grown, and bring us the product that they feel that we should have. That's, that was the mindset be behind that wording and that position. We're not experts in this field, but there's many people that are, and I think that this would be a highly sought after position, quite frankly. Could I ask Ian? One I, more. I don't think I understand what a negotiant is then. I thought it was somebody in the store who was helping people pick among different things there, but someone who would have to go out to all of the little farms that you're talking about and at various times during the season and the harvesting uh, to, to see how they're doing it would be quite a different yeah. proposition. Well, I, I, we, we called the position the negotiant. I'm not sure if you changed the wording of, of what that position actually was. But in the wine world, the negotiant goes to the vineyards and tries, looks at the grapes, looks at the vines, the health of the vines, the health of the, of the product, the soil, the terroir, and then goes and tastes the wine and makes, uh, you know, discoverable images of the wine. It's earthy, it's green, it, it's, it is what it is. This is the type of person that we would need to have to go to do the same thing, to look at the flower, to look at the plants, to see how it's grown, to test it, the THC levels, etc. I'm not an expert in it, and that's why I think that there's, there's people out there, and it may, we, we, we asked for one as a startup. We, you, may, you may end up with more than one. And you may end up in a situation where it's regional. But these folks would go out and work with these folks who are growers to tell them what, first and foremost, what the consumers are looking for. We don't want them growing something that consumers aren't looking for. So we're going to pattern them to, we're, we're gonna, this negotiant would pattern them to say, this is what the consumers are looking for. This is what they're buying in other states. This is what we need you to grow. Just with respect, this is an annual plant. It is not grapevines. No, no, ma'am. Uh, okay, I, I want to go to some other reps right now. The order is Representative Aaron, followed by Representative Nunes, and Representative Gamalo. Thank you, Representative Mr. Aaron. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you so much for coming in and, and talking to us today. My question is about um, advertising. And do you foresee that you would s use the same sort of advertising strategy that you do for the liquor, uh, for, for liquor and beer wine? Insofar as um, when you do your advertising budget for the liquor outlets, do you do that based on um, a percentage of your income, a percentage of sales. Um, how how do you how do you foresee uh, transitioning that kind of model to uh, selling cannabis? Well, I think now that the ability to advertise is going to be limited when you start. I think it really depends on what the federal government chooses to do. I think at at some point there may be a, a change of heart from the federal government as, as to in, in looking at how cannabis is uh, sold and how it's financed and how it's advertised. And I think that that would be something that we'd have to look at. Obviously, we're not going to 
we're not going to do anything outside of what we're allowed to do legally. Uh, so we'd have to look at the revenues and the advertising budget would be based on the revenues. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Representative Nunes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for taking my question. Um, I, I want to make a, a statement here. I think a negotiant is uh, like a market consultant, someone who's an expertise in, the, in, the, in that vertical, in that area, who, who knows the business that would go out and, and talk with the growers about what their products are about, and then would bring that information uh, back and make determinations on what type of contracts would be set with these growers, correct? That's correct. I wanted to clarify that Thank just a little you. bit. Coming from a consulting world, I, I understand much. that. Um, also, um, you know what, I think, no, I'm sorry. Um, Miss uh, Representative Aaron just asked the other question for advertising that I wanted to ask. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> Representative Gamalo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for coming in and informing us. Um, I noticed in the original uh, fiscal note that you didn't want a fourth division for the cannabis enforcement and licensing. And I'm wondering if the personnel costs that you might take on at a higher level are included in the um, estimate of the personnel. And if the negotiant, which sounds like it might be a expensive position, is also in that. Well, I, Estimate. I, I think that the cost of, of, of doing business in, in the original uh, dollars that we looked for, there obviously is going to be some loading costs, some load in costs when you do this. Uh, and we would ask the committee and we'd ask uh, to, to look at, obviously folks have to be uh, made whole, shall we say, when they, when they open a new division. It's going to be uh, a load on our finance division and enforcement division and marketing. And so I think there's a, going to be a period of time that part of those funds would be used to compensate those employees for writing rules, for writing job descriptions, for doing interviews, as well as you know creating office space, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, to have a separate division we didn't feel was necessary because mm -hmm. All, ev we do everything already yeah. within the confines of our business that this business does. Mm -hmm. Our model was looking at if the federal government ever had an issue with cannabis, we'd have everybody who worked on cannabis completely separate from anybody who worked on liquor. So the dollars could be accounted for separately, the job duties could be accounted for separately, the only time that I think you'll see any crossover is in the beginning where we're, where we're building this in. And after that, this will just be the division, the lines that we've drawn in the division will take care of themselves and they'll be separate unto themselves. Thank you. May I have one more question? Follow up. Um, in Northampton, Mass, uh, where my favorite knitting store is, one street over is a dispensary and they always have or had, I haven't been down for two years because of COVID, they always had police in the parking lot. Um, is that going to be something we'll need as well? I think, uh, <coughs> I think when Massachusetts first opened the recreational, there was a huge demand. Yeah. And, and uh, I think some of that has waned away as more stores have opened. Mm -hmm. I think in the beginning that we certainly have an enforcement division and they're certainly in tune with uh, crowd control and in tune with you know, keeping, we do it in our stores at the holiday seasons. So it's, it's, th it's the same but different. Okay. We're in the same, the same retail environment mm -hmm. and uh, we, we would expect that to happen in the beginning and we have accounted for that as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you. Representative. Re Representative Murphy followed by Representative Hatch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you both for coming in. Um, I, I was just curious about the comment you made about sound like the mom and pop, you know, shops, the local farms that would be a boon if they could grow some of this product for you. And I was initially thinking of this as a, somewhat of a vertically oriented model whereby you had greenhouses and then you went to produce and then you went to the retail shops. Does, so are you looking at this as a hybrid model in a sense where you can have local growers come in and then you have your own greenhouses that you would develop your own and 
Does that change any way you model it all? Not that close. We we aren't uh, we we aren't and 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 have no interest in that the growing end of the business. Okay. That's something that I think that the that the free market should should share in and and obviously profit from as well as the state. And from from an I just I've always thought originally from an agricultural standpoint we're a natural for this. We have we have the farms. We have the space. People, there's many, many thousands of folks out there that are great farmers. They, they know how to grow. And this is, this is right in line with what would serve them best hmm. and put some profits in their pockets as well as the towns. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Hatch. Thank you. Good morning, and, and thank you for taking my questions. And um, I'm I'm thinking in a long. I'm here primarily for budgetary concerns and expenditures that are planned or are requested. And one area that we're broaching on now is enforcement, and that's one thing I was curious about. You have a very capable group of enforcement officers now. We do. And they do and great what job. are your um, thoughts in the need for expansion. And if I'm broaching something that's already been discussed completely, uh, let me know. But um, I would be interested in, and I would think there would have to be an expansion of enforcement um, for marijuana or not. This is something I don't um, really know. But I would like to see what the plans are, how it's being implemented, and how their role and enforcement is going to be expanded in terms of, um, say, unauthorized use or things such as that, or will local um, municipalities with their officers be involved in, and how is that interlinked? Uh, I just, it'd be good to understand that and the cost of that is, is my concern. Well, I think in our fiscal note originally, we put in additional officers. We put in additional enforcement personnel uh, and I would, as far as our roles with the town, I would, uh, I would uh, allow the chief to make those decisions on how he would uh, administer whatever rules are written and working with the towns and, and municipalities. But we did ask for uh, additional enforcement personnel in, in our original uh, fiscal note. Is, is that um, annotated? I haven't seen that note yet, but is that annotated clearly that cost in the fiscal note or is it uh, part of the sum or part of the whole? I think it's part of the, it's summarized as the personnel cost, but we do have the breakdown of the positions that we were expecting to include, so we could always provide that breakdown. Yeah, I, I would like that if, if you could. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Lyon. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, if you have your indulgence, I have like a series of I'm trying to get to the math of numbers so we have a real idea of what we're doing, and it may involve a little bit back and forth, so if I have a little leeway to have a dialogue rather than just simple questions, I'd appreciate it. So thank you, Commissioner. Thank you for taking that question. I know we had a conversation earlier out in the hallway, and I wanted to kind of summarize some of that conversation, is that I think it was clear in, in, that this is going to be a rolling startup that um, – that obviously we're not going to have 10 stores on day one when we snap a finger and the law the, the bill becomes law um, and I think we were we talked about the idea of having three to four stores per year as a roll-up and then ultimately using the revenue generated from that to be able to fund the startup of the rest of the stores so that we don't have to have as much startup costs the full 14 million um, so if I do my math right and I'm using your your cannabis perspective spill here is that we know and, and I think representative Abrami had uh, said about 40% roughly of the revenue comes from edibles and edibles aren't in this conversation. So any of these numbers that we're looking at when we talk about uh, per capita costs or, or revenues are gonna be 60% of what the projection is roughly and to use this as a starting point. So as we're using, if we, if we end up with a, um, a $50 million revenue, net revenue startup start point, obviously we, we subtract out our um, 40 percent because we're not selling edibles we're down to 30 million dollars in revenue if all 10 stores were open we were estimating and then we know that in the first year we're only gonna have about a third of the stores open so then we got to subtract out make that one third of that 30 million so we're really looking at about 10 million to 10.5 million dollars 
first year revenue, assuming three stores open for a full calendar year. Would that be roughly a correct uh, expectation or rough number? Yes, I would agree with that. Okay. So we're looking at a $10.5 million first year expansion, and then every year as you open three or four more stores, in theory, that number doubles. It goes from 10 point five to 2021 and in the third year it comes up to the full whatever the number is uh 33 and change uh, 30 million dollars would that be kind of what we're looking at a three year to get the full projections in that third year we'll start seeing the full revenue of 10 stores that's an okay. accurate timeline i would think and to be clear and i think i'm right in the committee there's actually no limitation on the number of stores in this bill the only reason we talked about 10 stores was we needed a gauge for startup costs and so the $14 million we were talking about was, okay, assuming we did 10 stores, this is what the cost would be. But there is actually no limitation, if I'm correct, in the bill for the number of stores. You can use your ongoing operating revenues to be able to generate and open more stores past 10 if you feel there's a need. Is that correct? Yes. So there is a limitation of cultivators. On the grower, on the grower. Only on the grower side. Right. That's the only limitation. I've already taken a note to amend my amendment to get rid of that. Yeah, right. So... <laughs> um, so, um, I'm sorry, go back to numbers. Uh, so that we've taken care of the revenue side. We're estimating the full year of, of the first one third of the stores up, it's $10.5 million in revenue. Now to switch over to the cost side. So I'm looking at this fiscal note here that had all of the block graphs of talking about startup construction, everything else. And again, if I do my math, the rough personnel cost for all 10 stores was $5 million. If all stores were running, the personnel cost was $5 million. But we're actually looking at a revenue expectation of one point, I mean, a revenue cost, because again, if we ramp up the personnel along with the, uh, the stores, it's about 1.65 million per year, and that number will grow until you get to the third year and have all 10 stores open, and we'll be at a full um, $5 million personnel, uh, roughly. I, I'm not trying to yeah, well, the only thing I would say about that is the structure of the personnel was to start up the office, like the headquarters, to have the enforcement people, the finance people, the HR, um, and then adding in store personnel. So there might be more of an upfront cost in the personnel with the breakdown that we have of the positions that we were looking for. Okay, so I guess I'm just trying to get to what the what out of the revenue what are we going to actually spend in that first year assuming you know the first full operational year so I, I on a per store basis it looks like we're looking at an annual cost of around three hundred fifty thousand dollars per store is that right I think that was where I found the number was three hundred fifty thousand per so store is the operational expense for a store and then we have the personnel cost of 1.6 million on top of that and that's going to grow as it, the, both the operational cost and the and the personnel cost will grow, you know, linearly in theory, right? Yes. We're, we'll use that for modeling. So again, we're looking at in the first year, if you would open three stores, it's roughly $1.3 million in operational expenses for the stores and then roughly $1.6 million, we'll call it $2 million because I know the personnel aren't linear. So you gotta have some people in place like HR before you hire store staff. So um, we'll say it, it, it's $2 million in the first year. So we're looking at $1.6 million in operating expenses for the first year to get the first store up or first sets of stores up yeah. roughly. So we have yes. numbers. Great. Last thing I just wanted to comment on, it was something I just made note. We were talking about law enforcement and enforcement and it's true that um, all of your liquor inspectors are certified full-time police officers from the Hampshire Police Standards Training. They've already had the drug training, and what's legal, what's not legal, and, and those kind of things already. So it's just a matter of hiring another full-time police officer and maybe giving some specialized training relative to this specific law, but because uh, it'll be new. Um, but other than that, they're already full-time police officers with full-time arrest and investigation and um, detention capabilities, correct? They're a fully well-rounded uh, police department. Um, I think I got the math out of the way. I think that took care of most of the items. We, uh, we know generally what the idea is now on revenue. We know generally what the idea is on cost. As, and, and I can talk to the amendment and some of the things I did to address that and what I talked to finance and got. Uh, I, well, I have a favor still pending with the chairman. I, don't have a, I didn't have a favor with, with the chairman of finance, but I did get some commitments from her that we can talk about. Right. That, that was going to be my question, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, Representative Bronny. Yeah. Can we spend a few minutes on that and break the number to everybody? We have two fiscal people here in terms of what 
that the chair of finance is willing to absorb that for the next fiscal year correct this next fiscal year uh, um, allocation of 4.6 million is that correct well th the gross appropriation will be five million dollars for this bill um, because we also have the hundred and fifty thousand yeah, dollars that goes to something right. else and so goes to HHS, uh, yeah. the chair the, the chair of finance told uh, the um, Chris Shea's office, what the uh, legislative budget, budget administrators administration office that to earmark five million dollars for this bill. Okay, so for I all guess the question then, with that in mind, can they react to about how many stores can we open the first year with five million? I, I know there's a lot more upfront on on the overhead positions internal to the operation, and then so that's the kind of number we're working with. Uh, so I think it's important that you know that um, for that first. Just for next fiscal year, is that correct? Five million for next fiscal year, and then the anticipation is that after the first store is open, that then there'll be self-funding. If I may, Mr. Chair, respond. So, so again, I, I the way the bill was the way I restructured the bill was initially we had to pay back as the first item out of revenue, right. and I inverted that and I changed the operating expense to the first item so that they can add their new stores in as part of their growth process, as part of their operational expense before we start doing it. And the secondary item I put was the repayment re um, of the funds. So it gives them a revenue stream to be able to, again, invest back into themselves to open the next store and open the next store and open the next store um, to get to where we're, we're finally you know, making decent money to everybody else gets money. Um, so uh, Before so we go any further. Um, so the question is, on the five million dollars that that's appropriated, can you bring up three stores in the first year? We feel that we can, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. So yeah, again, so Representative Romney, yes, the idea is to have them reinvest, be able to reinvest some of the funds they get um, before we start doing other disbursements, so we can get to a full model with. A decent number of stores that generates enough revenue for everything we want. Okay, I want to remind the committee is that we're going to continue the work session. Uh, if we can get through the other bills this morning, if not, we'll continue it in the afternoon, and then we'll also continue it again on Monday, and then Wednesday next week. We have to exec it out. So, any further questions of the commissioner? Yes, Representative. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, earlier, you mentioned how New Hampshire is agricultural in its nature, and you use an example of Maine having 650 growers and 75 stores. That's a 8.6 grower to store ratio, given a sense of supply chain. But this New Hampshire proposal is 15 growers for maybe 10 stores, maybe more. And more stores would only drive that ratio from 1.5 cultivators to storefronts, if you want to use that uh, example. Are we going to have a supply chain problem? As far as 8.6 growers to stores in Maine, 1.5 growers to storefronts in New Hampshire. I, I think if we limit it to 15, that, that will, as I've, as I've said, I feel that that would be an issue. Yeah, one follow-up? Follow-up, and, and that 15 limitation is a real problem with us. And Agreed. We're solve it. And, and to further elaborate on the 15, if it, if it stays at 15, wouldn't that give great preference to the largest possible cultivators and growers and leave out smaller farms? I think it would certainly show favoritism. That's all. Thank you. Fine. Great question. Uh, Representative Almey. Uh, I'm sorry. I think we have to discuss this later. But small farms that are not growing indoors can only do one to two crops a year at the most. Uh, small farms are going to be producing product that is very different uh, from what one I to the uh, other, which is a problem. Uh, Representative um, Almey. I've uh, been working in agri I worked in agriculture 25 years. Yeah. Representative Almey, uh, yes. I want to limit this to questions of the commissioner. Yeah, I know. And then once we're through that, okay. then we want to go to the yeah. other bills. I, I did. Then we'll come back. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 
Now I've forgotten the other question I had. Sorry. Representative Spilsbury. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Loffman anticipated a good portion of my question. So um, it's not typical that states engage in entrepreneurial business activity like this. Fortunately, we have a successful model with the uh, Liquor Commission to look at. But in inevitably, uh, an entrepreneurial uh, enterprise has to work in supply demand conditions where competition is generally considered an advantage in terms of uh, uh, superior service, superior product, um, best pricing, et cetera, et cetera. So we don't need to go into the economics, but <clears throat> wouldn't uh, the answer to the 15 uh, producer uh, issue, which I think we all agree is too constrained, uh, be not to lift it to a higher number, but to rather have no numerical limit on the number of growers, but rather instead rely on your licensing criteria to determine who qualifies and let that be unlimited. I feel that that would be a prudent business move. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, Re Representative Ames. Uh, I think about two questions. First is, uh, about your timeline, you're ramping up the three stores in the first year, that discussion. Um, don't you need to have regulations in place before you go forward? And how long will that take? I think that, you know, obviously rules need to be written and, and people need to be hired within the organization before we can branch out to the stores. Uh, I, you know, rules would take some time. I think that there was an October date in uh, the original, one of the original drafts that we feel would be too constraining. And uh, as far as opening the stores, I mean, you've seen what we've done with the liquor and wine outlets and how many we've opened over a period of time. We've opened as many as seven in one year. This past year, we've opened four. Next year, we'll open four. So to open three stores with the type of retail footprint that we're talking about, we feel would be much easier than opening uh, a 12 to 25,000 square foot store. I mean, these stores are, w will be small. They'll be uh, technically advanced because everything has to be taken out of climately controlled safes and put into climately controlled cases. And everything obviously has to be uh, under uh, cameras, we'll have smart safes like we do in our stores now, we'll have armored car pickup like we do in our stores now. So from a technological standpoint, the stores will be compact but very advanced. I feel that we can do, I feel that we can safely do three in the first year. And we may in fact, you know, we may in fact be able to do more depending on how much groundwork uh, we can get done and the availability of the products that we need. Just like anything else, uh, you know, build out takes time. Sure. We're finding that steel and, 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 you know, lumber and cases and shelving are all taking an, an exponential amount of time at this point. So. Okay. okay, thank you for that. Uh, I just have one follow, uh, a separate question. Follow up. Yeah. Uh, I, it's about revenues and the projection of revenues. And uh, it's not really the ramp up, but but trying to figure out what revenues will come from this enterprise. Um, and uh, I'd like to, I'd like to, if you could reach back to give uh, two parts to that estimate. One is, uh, what, what is the number that you're projecting now? I'm a little unclear on that. And then the second thing is, uh, what about edibles? Because we've heard a lot about how edibles are a very important part of the uh, of the market, and uh, the consumers are. Uh, that's what many consumers want, um, and yet in this bill, as it's written, uh, edibles are not going to be on your shelves. Uh, so um, have, I haven't heard anything about how the absence of edibles affects your projections. Well, I think that in, in looking at what edibles do across the country, I think 
you're looking at somewhere between 35 to 45 percent of the business in uh, in a retail location so I think that you could safely subtract that number from projections uh, should should edibles not be allowed to be in these particular locations and the, the larger number that uh, you're working with the the 35% th the would come off of what of the 50 million of the 50 million 50 thank you There's one part of the first question was, how long do you, would it take to get the re regulations? And I, I don't want it to, to take a hard and fast stand on that, Mr. Chairman. I think that it would certainly take some time, and, and we'd have to we'd have to look at we'd have to look at what, what was being asked of the commission from a financial standpoint. Uh, what we were being asked to work with. I certainly think that would, wouldn't be more than, I, I think it would be a, at least six months, perhaps a little bit more. Oh, okay, um, six to eight months. Uh, Representative Bronny. Yeah. Uh, thank you, yeah, the subcommittee, that was one of the issues we talked about, and we all concluded that what was in the bill was too tight of a time frame. It is. So that would, it, so the minimum was at least, what did you just say? I'm sorry. Six. I think it would take six months, at least six. Six, months. Uh, six to nine months. Yeah. To, to do the, to finish the rules, yeah. To, to do the rules. I mean, that's getting their part. Getting their, <coughs> then then they have to get it to gel car after that. Mm -hmm. So, when you add that in, it's you know, because this is all new. I mean, they're starting from scratch here with these rules. Oh, I mean, okay. this isn't adding rules to an existing agency. Thank you, uh, Representative Tucker. Yes, uh, I don't remember which of the three lengthy days we discussed so many subjects at session, but there was mention made of the uh, wages paid to, by the Liquor Commission at the stores on the floor at some time, and I don't remember in, in relation to what. But would you anticipate the same wage scales at the cannabis stores as you do uh, at the liquor stores, and could you give us an idea of what those, uh, the average person working at a liquor store makes? Because we would end up being employers, we right? Would. So you are employers, and therefore when they bring it up at a session, it's talking about what we are endorsing as wage scales. Well, I can, I can tell you that the the wages at the liquor, the starting wages at the Liquor Commission are uh, around $13 an hour for a clerk or a laborer, and it goes up from there. Obviously, we follow the same uh, scale that the state uses. Our, our folks are paid uh, at the same scale. Now, in uh, a cannabis location, I feel that there would be uh, a great amount of education that these folks would need to undertake prior to them working as a retail person in this store. From a labor standpoint, actually meaning you're not picking up 47 pound average cases of spirits. You're, you're from, so from a, a strenuous labor standpoint, it would be the labor piece of it would be less intense. But I also feel that there's an educational piece that needs to be brought in, and there's certainly uh, a certain maturity level that we would expect these employees to have. And I don't feel that following the state guidelines is going to attract the type of employees that we would need. So where we would need to be at this point, I'm unsure, because I've done less uh, homework on that based on uh, what private industry is paying, but I can assure you that it would probably be somewhere uh, at least one-third to 50 percent more than what we're paying our retail people in the stores now. Right. I would project that we would have to be somewhere in the 18 to 25 dollar an hour. So that does make a difference on the revenues. 
I mean, that. Well, I think what it does, it certainly does. But I also think that, you know, uh, rent is a function of volume. So if we run the stores properly, which I can assure you we will, and we have the pricing that's competitive with the New England states, I feel that uh, our projections are conservative. And I've always, we've always taken that approach in everything we do. And so uh, would you anticipate, excuse me, Follow Chairman, up. thank you. I apologize. Uh, would you expect the same benefit packages to be uh, at the liquor stores as well as the cannabis stores? I think that we would follow the state guidelines as far as full-time benefits are concerned. Okay. And I believe that if we, I'm, I'm not sure that we put any part-time people in the stores in our projections. And if we did, it was a de minimis amount. I feel that this is folks that, uh, that would be interested in this type of thing are they're professionals in nature uh, they, they 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 have the knowledge of the product uh, you know they're involved with the product already somewhere and those are the, the type of people that we would need to hire thank you Mr. Uh, Commissioner, just a quick question going back to the rules conversation. If I was to amend, we, we did amend the rules because we recognize in the subcommittee and the amendment I have, but we used December of 22. But if I was to change that so it wasn't a hard date and just said you have to have it eight months after, rules must be established eight months after passage, would that be reasonable? I think that would certainly be fair, Representative. Thank, Thank you. you. And this may be a question of the chair, Mr. Chairman. Um, to, as far as a uh, question would be concerned about regulation, is regulation part of policy or is regulation part of this committee? Thank, then I'll cut my question. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Schamberg. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this may be a question for the chair also. Uh, uh, we have a fiscal note. Is you're going to be a representative from the DRA here uh, about these appropriation numbers. Will they be here this afternoon or tomorrow right. or Monday? They don't get involved with liquor, or will they get involved with this? Well, I have a follow-up question here then. Uh, in determining the numbers, since we're talking about numbers, and I see the agencies they contacted or from administrative services, corrections, health and human services, justice, revenue, safety, judicial, judicial council, municipal association, and the association of counties. And the gentleman speaks about agriculture. Why was the Department of Agricultural Markets and Foods not contacted about the cost to them? Um, uh, Representative Chair, Romney. Chair's gonna allow me to answer that. So can you look, what number, what's the number on the bill you're looking at on that sheet? Because there, there's one from a prior bill that was rent, uh, uh, the late Rennie we Cushing's bill. And that was, that was a very extensive, the, the, the numbers that you, those numbers are from the last major uh, bill. We wanted to try to compare those numbers to this bill. So that fiscal note you're looking at, and that's why you see revenue there. Department of Revenue actually did the revenue estimates because it was taxing then. It was tax. That was a tax bill. This is not a tax bill. This is a net revenue bill. So, so on the top of the rest fiscal now, what, what's the num what's the bill number? HB, I'll come on. Oh, there it is. HB two three seven. Right. Exactly. So that's a bill from last year. That was a full, uh, full uh, uh, legalization and commercialization bill traditional model bill. That's why that's what you see there. So that, uh, although even with that, the revenues, I, I mentioned that earlier, it was, the, the Department of Revenue did do those revenue estimates because it was taxing. They taxed at the agriculture level and then they taxed at the retail level. And I think it, at the upper end, it was like 40 million is what they had come up with. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you again. 
Uh, I'm just asking, since edibles are currently not in the bill right now, what is the product line that we are talking about? Is it just flowers? Is it, you know, topicals, cartridges? I mean, or is it just flowers right now? I think it w would be anything that was available for retail sale other than the edibles, which would be flour, it would be topicals, it would be uh, concentrates. Concentrates. It okay. It would be. It would be vape. It would be accessories. Okay. So it's everything else uh, except for edibles right now. Great. Thank you. Any further questions? Uh, Representative Ames, followed by Representative Elmi. Sorry. We've talked about rules, um, and, uh, but we haven't talked about uh, how they, the rules have to address uh, cultivators. You're going to be the regulatory authority for this whole, whole thing. Um, and uh, so um, cultivators will be part of it. And I have a, a, a particular question about uh, – the product that cultivators will be growing and then uh, presumably moving on to manufacturers and then moving on to your stores. Uh, and that is tracking these, the product from the beginning to when it's sold. Uh, and in prior bills, we've had a tracking system built into the legislation, which involves unique identifiers um, there's nothing about that in this bill, which we've raised as a concern when we we're meeting as a subcommittee. Um, I wonder if you thought of at all about this. The context, of course, is there's a black market, and it's considerable, and price has something to do with, with uh, diminishing that, I would assume, c competition, but also uh, the ease at which, or the lack of ease, uh, uh, people playing in the black market can uh, function um, and I should think identifying the ability to identify product uh, would relate to that. So that's the context for my question. Well, I, again, I go back, t I go back to uh, the, the rulemaking and I go back to the negotiant because in my mind that person has the level of expertise to guide the commission, not only in the rulemaking, but in the process of cultivation, harvesting, and transportation. Go ahead, Representative Brown. Yeah. When I chaired the liquor, uh, the liquor, when I chaired the marijuana commission, that was one of our recommendations to have a tracking system. It did, the bill came over to us without that in it, and I didn't bring that one up really earlier on because it was that really part of our job here. But it sounds like you'll be addressing that if this bill passes as a need to. Um, other states have that where they track it every step of the way in, in the supply the chain, I guess you want to call it, yeah. in the supply chain of, of, uh, of the product. Okay. Much like we do with liquor now. Right. And, okay. you know, we affidavit. So you don't, you don't need yeah. something specific in the bill. You'll, you'll be addressing that as part of your rules. It will be addressed in the rules. Okay, thank you. Representative Ames, are you all through? I am, thank you. Representative Alney. Thank you. Uh, two questions, again, unfortunately. On, on, oh, no, they're, they're actually together. On what is enforcement going to be doing with marijuana that they are not already doing now, just to make sure it isn't bleeding into the entire law enforcement on cannabis? Uh, does, uh, do you, oh, I guess the other one's a sub part of it. Uh, do, what, the, are they going to be enforcing only what's going on in the stores? Yeah. Are they going to be trying to enforce uh, the the um, product growing on in the on the farms uh, to see if they're bringing in product from somewhere else? Uh, 
in your question. One, this is my question. One of one of my two questions. One of them is is that how much how much enforcement do they actually have to do under this bill? Does it only have to be what's going on in the stores and the supply chain? They would be concerned with the product in in our stores, the supply chain from from the grower to the stores and work with, as they do now, other local law enforcement agencies and the state police on anything outside of that scope. If something happens in a particular town, if, if, they, if they see something going on that uh, they feel is, is, is worthy of bringing to a level, then that's, that's what they do now. We work hand in hand with the municipalities and state police now and we would take that the same way. The commissioner has to leave to go to fiscal. Yes. Yeah. And we thank you for coming here and answering, addressing our questions. Thank you very much. Okay. Mr. Chairman, um, members of the committee, thank the work, you. We appreciate it. The work session on House Bill 1598 is closed. Just, I think the on enforcement, um, Rep Representative Valmini was going there. There's some a myriad of questions that need to be cleared up for enforce enforcement. I, I mean, they don't automatically happen in rulemaking. There's a, there's a, I see a gap between what's been explained and oh. what is needed to know. That's all. And if there's a future time where enforcement can come and iterate on those things, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Representative Hatch. Yeah, and we do we do have him here, but uh, you're willing to come back at any at one next week. Yeah, that may work too. I, I actually, I just I think it's better in the open forum. I'm yeah. willing to get together any time, but just just so everybody has a clear uh, understanding of the process and what's going to be done going forward. And I think it's kind of important, Mr. Chair. It doesn't have to happen now can happen anytime. Uh, thank you. Then, since we have the enforcement here, it will take 10 minutes. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk. Okay. If you can come up and I open, reopen the work session on House Bill 1598. Th thank you, Mr. Chair. And if you could identify yourself and answer the questions. Thank you. Uh, for the record, my name is Mark Armaganian. I am the chief and director of uh, the Liquor Commission's Division of Enforcement and Licensing. My name is Danielle Elson. I am the deputy director of the Liquor Commission's Division of Enforcement and Licensing. Uh, uh, Representative Hatch. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I think it would be worthy maybe for everybody, um, and thank you for staying and, and taking the questions, is just explain uh, what enforcement will do, uh, the sky view picture of what you'll be doing in terms of enforcing cannabis um, uh, from start to finish. I, I, just in my mind, and I'm glad you referenced that, you'll be working very closely with other law enforcement agencies who are overseeing this now, and and th that dynamic won't change that much, or will it? And and if you could just explain the extent of your involvement in enforcement for cannabis uh, going forward, is that clear enough? I mean, it, it is. It is. Thank you for your question, Representative. Um, first and foremost, um, I think we've testified several times that our um, our partnerships with our municipal partners and state partners is overwhelmingly great. Um, we are, and, and thank you for bringing that up earlier, and I know I've testified in front of you guys uh, a handful of times on, on this issue, who we are and what we do. Um, right now we are uh, regulating the industry of alcohol and tobacco, um, which kind of gets forgotten. Uh, the tobacco side of it. This is very similar to that infra infrastructure. 
Um, we, as uh, Representative Almy brought up, uh, we would be looking at this, and, and the chairman said so eloquently, we're looking at this from a level of the tier system. Um, there are many states that do it that way, regulate that way, from what we would look at manufacturing on the uh, alcohol side of the house, we're looking at cultivation on the cannabis side of the house. And we would be regulating from that level all the way through with our, not only our investigators that have been earmarked to do this, uh, these duties, but also with our uh, civilian auditors who will be trained in, in this specific uh, realm. Um, when it comes to uh, our infrastructure, as the chairman brought it up, I, I foresee this, and we've had uh, conversations about this breaking down further into a bureau system, uh, such as what I came from over at State Police, where uh, we would be looking at um, the Bureau of Cannabis Control. In that cannabis control, as long as the uh, model right now that we're looking at is a state model and not a privatized model. We could do that with approximately, uh, the way we look at it now, about uh, four investigators with a leadership structure to that. Um, uh, auditors, we're looking at three auditors and, and we also have a licensing component of that too because we'd have to ask, add staff to the front end of the house. Uh, for a lack of a better term. Um, and, and we do foresee that um, uh, a, a possibility, we don't know, this is an unknown, but a possibility of a black market. Um, we deal with that now on the alcohol and tobacco side of the house. Um, we have a special investigative unit that deals with uh, fraud rings and... Um, uh, theft rings throughout the state, uh, bootlegging tobacco into this state. Uh, there is a bootlegging. We don't see it because, as, as most of you know, um, I'm not from the marketing side of the house, but we sell alcohol pretty darn cheap. Um, so we don't have the bootlegging problem that we do, that, that we see with tobacco. Um, and we have an infrastructure that um, is set up in model form right now. Uh, to deter against that with our, the assistance of our, our local and state partners. Did I answer your question, uh, Representative Hatch? Yes, thank you. I, I just wanted an overview. And then, uh, for example, if there is uh, enforcement taking place and somebody is illegally selling or utilizing cannabis, in whatever manner, um, how far the agency takes it to adjudication, or for the most part, you would be would you be turning that over to other uh, law enforcement entities to carry it through adjudicating? Because that can take a lot of time. Ergo, cost. A absolutely. Uh, yeah. That's a very good question. Thank you for it. Um, as you as you know, and and we've had conversations. There are certain cases that we will take to fruition, um, and and from its inception on through. Um, the reason for that is the continuity of the case, consistency with the case, continuity of evidence. Uh, but I foresee, and I know a lot of you have heard me say this, um, I foresee this um, uh, venture, if you will, to be handled the same way as everything else in the division, and that's starting accountability with our education platform. We believe education is going to be a big part of this, um, and it's going to be a big part of assisting us assist our new prospective licensees in being in compliance. We believe that um, it, we have proven, I, I should correct myself, we have proven that that education platform has been very, very um, uh, adequate in, in having industry actually in a in a different sense supporting our endeavors the the people we re regulate like us um that's different throughout the country 
um, because sometimes it's the iron fist coming down and not telling people how, how, what did I do wrong? How did I do it wrong? And I'm sure you're going to come in next month and tell me I'm doing it wrong again. And you've never told me what I did wrong. So we believe from an auditing view all the way through to the regulatory portion of it and, and enforcement, um, begins with that education piece. Um, and I know you've heard me talk about that quite often. Representative Hatch, anything else? Anybody else? If, if I could, uh, Deputy uh, Chief uh, Elston had a little bit more to add to that. If I could give her a couple seconds, if that's why. Uh, another, you know, building out on that educational platform is also going to be the youth access. To, to the product, uh, where the primary law enforcement agency and the youth access to tobacco. Um, also, you know, we, we regulate the industry in terms of youth access with alcohol. So a large component of that enforcement umbrella involves um, preventing the youth access to cannabis. Hey, Representative Tucker followed by Representative Elney. Yes, I was just thinking about the differences between liquor and cannabis. So when you buy liquor, if you're buying it by the drink or whether you're buying it by the bottle at a liquor store, the rules of where you can use and consume that product are very clear. But with cannabis, how is it going to work? Where will one know where one can consume the cannabis? Will there be smoking in restaurants? Will there be outdoor patios? Can you go to a baseball stadium and use it? Um, public spaces? How are we going to manage this aspect of giving the state seal, so to speak, that it's all right to, to buy and use cannabis? How will that translate into the day-to-day -day operations of the state and where people can use that cannabis. And that seems to fall, to some extent, under enforcement. How and will your people know how they can help people know where they can consume the product? Well, first of all, thank you for your question, Representative. I think, first of all, um, enforcement does just that. And I've been successful in this career for 35 years living by that. And, and that, that adage, and that is that we enforce the laws that you all create here. Um, we are going to be diligent with our rulemaking on this. We feel that the rulemaking can create bookmarkers, if you will. Um, we will also assist all of you in uh, seeing what the industry standards are throughout the country um, and and coming up with the best if that is what you all choose and the other um, the other committees uh, throughout this building that are involved in this choose to do um, we will help you um, make sure that the people that have chosen to consume this product are the ones that actually um, are the ones that are ingesting it um, just like tobacco. I mean, we always think liquor, but we regulate tobacco in this state also. And it's very similar to tobacco and nicotine. Thank you. Uh, a comment from Representative Bromley. Yes, so in the bill, they do have provisions for no smoking outdoors. Any public place is in the bill. So that's that's taken care of. And I can't recall if, if a... a I guess sometimes I get my things mixed up, whether it's in this bill or another, uh, about apartment buildings not not being able to smoke in apartment buildings because it goes from one apartment to the other. I'm not quite sure if it's in this bill or not, but definitely no outside public place can you smoke or, or even use edibles. Thank no, you. Nor in any moving vehicle. Huh? Nor in any and, and moving in, vehicles in as well. Any moving vehicle. Right. Yeah, we're not, we're not talking about tobacco. We're talking about marijuana. Yeah. And I've seen I've seen some states that have 
banned it from apartment buildings. And I can't recall if it's in this bill or not. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Re Representative Almy. Thank you. I think I counted up at least eight new staff for enforcement. About how much is that like? And some of them are high level, the auditors. Uh, about how much is that in the personnel costs? Um, I would only be, it, it probably would be irresponsible for me to give you a figure right now, Representative, and thank you for your question. Just because I don't have that flow chart with me and I don't have the exact numbers on benefit costs. You, you um, could provide that. Uh, and I think Tina, Tina was the perfect person to have for that question. Um, I could I could ballpark it, but it would be irresponsible for me yeah. to do that at this point. But it's about eight staff. Um, I'm looking at approximately eight staff, correct, yeah. with leadership involved. Thank you. And could and I oversight. ask a question about edibles? If we do not do edibles, there will be a black market in edibles. On are you going to be responsible for that, or will that be someone else? Um, thank you, thank you, Representative. Um, right now, to be quite frank about this, there are edibles out there right now. Oh yeah. Um, we know that CBD is in our combination stores right now. It, it's a problem that we've been talking with the uh, DEA on, um, and and of course CBD topical is legal because of the federal farm bill, uh, but the adulterated products aren't um, we we would we would do as we do right now with those products and our combinations that show up we handle those issues um, that is something that traditional law enforcement hasn't wanted to touch um, uh, and and I can't actually point at one jurisdiction or another but with all the other issues that are going on in the traditional law enforcement world, it's something that we would actually be regulating also. Thank you, that helps. Representative Bromney, that's a defining a term. Uh, combination stores, what are those? Oh, I'm sorry. Stores. <laughs> Grocery <laughs> stores, oh, convenience okay. stores, right, right. I'm sorry. Right, just for the, <laughs> Thank <Okay>. you. <laughs> Any further questions of the enforcement off branch? Seeing none, thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm closing the work session on House Bill 1598 right now. Right, just up here, I know we're going to pick up in the afternoon. A lot of them are here for that. So. Oh, yeah. And this afternoon, we'll, we'll pick up the work session on this bill. But right now, I want to go to House Bill 1537 work session. And that's relative to the definition of a cigar bar. Does the committee have questions relative to this bill on 1237? Because if there's no questions and if you're satisfied, I'd like to um, exec this bill. Can we just pause for a minute to get the papers out? Just trying to find the papers. Okay. My papers. Um, we'll wait till he gets yeah, his papers. Can I ask a question? Yes. Can someone just go over the concerns we did have when we, at the hearing? Because I don't remember either. I didn't bring my papers. Okay. Um, Re Representative Bernstein. He's going to pull up his. Because when you do look at the bill, it changes, it adds to cigars. It adds cigarettes, loose tobacco, 
and it eliminates from the definition as well as revenue generated from other tobacco sales in stores, including cigarettes and loose tobacco sales. Can I? So can I? Yeah. So read revenue from Kino, mail order, and internet sales shall not be used to determine whether an establishment satisfies the definition of a cigar bar. So, Mr. Chair. Okay, uh, Representative Ames, do you have your paperwork? I've got my paperwork. Okay, uh, so, Representative Brown. So here's, my, here's what I see here. It sounds this bill, it seems like this bill was filed for one store. Um, and we had, we had uh, testimony from the Cigar Association of New Hampshire, which represented five owners in 12 retail locations. And they didn't see a need for this bill. The bill is really there to help them help this one store hit the 60 percent mark in terms of tobacco uh, cigars or tobacco products being sold um, I, I don't think we need I don't, at this moment I'm an ITL <laughs> on this because I, I don't think we should change our current statute to and, and that, that one store I don't think testified if I recall uh, Cloutier is his bill I think uh, they both talked about this one store that feels without this they can't hit that 60 percent. So, so that's my understanding. Representative Alamey. I think that's very well put, except that Cloutier, I think, was representing the store owner. <laughs> Other than that, I agree entirely. Uh, Representative Spelsberg. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. M my sense was that the bill is originally drafted and had a serious problem, A, because it was changing the formula by lowering the percentage threshold, right. and, and B, because it was temporary and therefore was going to uh, whip back in a couple of years. But uh, my sense is from the uh -huh. perspective of this committee, the Commerce um, Committee solved that problem. If they're okay with it and the House is okay with it, I'm not sure what the Ways and Means issue is. Representative Janine and then Representative Lang. Yes, I just wanted to say that I um, echo what uh, Representative Abramney said. Um, the Cigar Association had no issues with it at all. And, um, and I think it might have been Representative Stapleton that mentioned that um, with the pandemic, people weren't frequenting um, cigar bars and uh, as much, but I mean we're kind of nearing the end of of that. Where you know mask mandates are being lifted, people are starting to go out a lot more. I think this is a, a temporary problem that's um, in one specific instance that is most likely going to go away anyhow. So I think um, I'm I would also be ITL on this. Representative Lang, followed by Representative Nunes. So I, I guess I agree with Representative Spilsbury that. I'm not sure what the, what we're doing here. The commerce fixed the problems with the temporary nature and those kind of things, and we're down just left to whether or not we agree that the percentage should include loose cigarettes and loose tobacco versus just straight cigar sales. Um, and I, I guess I, I'm I'm more in the line of a if it helps the business and it doesn't hurt the state, then why would we oppose this? Um, if the business can generate more revenue and can um, can increase again. Don't forget, loose tobacco and c cigarette sales generates revenue for us. Um, it, it it seems like it's a win-win, and I'm just not sure why we wouldn't allow. Whether it's just one today, it could be five tomorrow, and this may help them tomorrow. Um, I I just don't see a downside of passing this bill. I guess is my point is I see no downside of passing it. Representative Nunes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, echo those sentiments and would also like to say that in the bill, it doesn't say that they can use cigarettes and loose tobacco inside the cigar bar. It says they can sell it to meet the guideline that they need to meet uh, for, their, for their profits yeah. in order to be, uh, to be in statute. Um, so we're not turning it into an entire smoking establishment with drinks or food. It is still only cigars and maybe, is it pipes too, I think? Uh, but uh, uh, no, I'm talking about what they can consume currently right now. Yeah. Um, 
and uh, if they're not going, if they're just using it towards sales, it's all tobacco. Whether it's cigar tobacco or it's cigarette tobacco or loose tobacco or whatever, it's all tobacco. Uh, so um, I know these are niche uh, um, uh, establishments that were uh, that were put into statute to be able to do this, uh, but I don't I don't see a downside to allowing them to have the the full tobacco sale in there if they're still only consuming what was originally appropriated for them. Okay. Representative Aaron. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So as I understand it, the bill is amended, as amended, allows for the sale of cigarettes to be included to meet the 60% threshold that they uh, have to meet. Um, they already sell cigarettes, but it's not counted towards, or, and loose tobacco, but it's not counted towards their 60%. So it's not like they aren't selling the product already. Um, I, I, I actually, I don't see a problem with making the change, but, um, you know, since it's not like they're being allowed to sell a product now that they haven't been allowed to sell. It just counts towards their threshold. I guess I'm um, hearing some of the comments now. I, I have a question. It, does anybody know why Why was this law initially put into place where it was 60 percent? What is the significance of the 60 percent? I don't know if anybody can answer that. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if anybody can answer that question. Well, I think I remember. Representative Almy? Yeah, that they, they the cigar groups, which we have a representative of, of right here, had suggested that, I believe, to differentiate it on, I think that we should be clear that we are not talking about whether you can smoke or, or sell or whatever the, cig the other kinds of tobacco. All we're talking about is are we going to loosen the requirements so that that on other um, cigar stores, if they get into trouble being cigar bars, uh, can still remain as cigar bars because we've lowered the requirement for, for the percentage of sales. Well, that's the, uh, Representative Curtis, Ray. do you have something you want to say? The other lobbyists for this. I'll, I'll ask you a question. I'll ask you a question and get you going. Go ahead. So, um, I think your testimony was that your your facilities that you represent didn't really see a need for this change. Uh, but I guess the second part of that is, do you have an objection to this change? As I mentioned at the hearing, or do they do they have an objection? To right. And first of all, uh, Mr. Chair, I'm Curtis Barry. I represent the Cigar Association of New Hampshire, which is a coalition of five owners in about a dozen locations, four of which have a cigar bar license. Um, no, as, as I mentioned at the hearing, uh, the association had no position on the bill as introduced, has no position currently either way uh, as the bill is, is before the Ways and Means Committee. Um, and I can attempt to answer Representative Nunez's question. I, I think the philosophy on the 60% was that New Hampshire does not license or allow a standalone bar where somebody walks in and just has a drink. So we have a requirement for a liquor license currently relative to food. You have to have a certain amount of your sales in food um, in order to qualify for the liquor license. The philosophy was you know, much the same. You needed to do something. You need to be, as I put it at the hearing, I think, you had to be the cigar store first and then you could get a liquor license, not the other way around. Thank you. Anything else to ask Mr. Barry? Thanks. Thank you. So uh, then, let me take a straw poll. Uh, let me take a straw poll. Mm. <clears throat> All those that would be in favor of passing the bill as is, raise your hand. <laughs> okay, you twisted my arm here. <laughs> okay. Then well, I, it's no big deal. I I, I just don't like. Uh, may I speak? To, I'm sorry. I just don't like doing something for when, when it's only one store coming in. That's that's what bothered me the most. That, that's but fine. If, that's but fine. If, but if the will is the will, I'm 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 on board too. 
uh, let's get on with it. Uh, we'll yeah. go into an executive. Representative Hacks and Phillips. Mr. Chair, I just was wondering if I could ask the committee um, just briefly. You know, I think during one of the hearings, a question was raised about the DRA's fiscal note um, um, assertion that a reduction in the percentage of revenue a licensee must generate from non premium cigar sales is likely to reduce the tobacco related rev tax revenue. And I, I recall that there were several folks on the committee who said, they would like to hear from the DRA as to their explanation for that assertion. It, it didn't seem to be to make sense at the time. I, I believe there was like a counterintuitive thought. Um, if you were to reduce the threshold, why would that reduce tobacco related tax revenues? Um, did anybody recall? Did we get an answer to that? Uh, Representative Almy. First, it isn't the DRA. They don't have anything to do with this. It's the Liquor Commission, yeah. which oversees uh, DRA a long time ago, had something to do with it, but it got moved over. Yeah, the fiscal notes from the Liquor Commission. Yeah. Oh. And the second, on, um, I don't, these things are already sold in uh, most cigar bar bars, I believe, um, as a secondary product if somebody wants some. Uh, and so it doesn't seem likely that it's going to change uh, tobacco consumption one way or the other. Okay. Uh, I'm going to open the executive session on House Bill 1237. Uh, Representative Lang. I move out a pass on House Bill 1237 FN. Representative Lang, is OTP. Second, Mr. By Chairman. Second by Representative. Oh, you have this? Any further discussion on the motion of what to pass on House Bill 1237? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the vote. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We'll begin the voting on House Bill 1237 with a motion of all to pass with Representative Abrami. Yes, with my arms slightly twisted, yes. <laughs> Representative Lang. Yes. The clerk votes yes. Representative Janigian. Yes. Representative Nunez. Yes. Representative Spilsbury. Yes. Representative Aaron. Yes. Representative Almy? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Hold on, give me one sec. When I say one sec, I, I guess I'm at 45. Give me. We're almost there. Representative Ames. Yes. Representative Malloy. Yes. The Honorable Thomas C. Schomburg. Representative Schomburg votes yes, Mr. Clerk. Thank you, sir. Representative Tucker. Yes. Representative Gomarlo. Yes. Representative Hacken Phillips. Oh, yes. Thank you. Representative Murphy. Yes. Chairman yes. Major. Yes. 16 to The vote being 16 to nothing, the motion of ought to pass passes. And without objection, go on consent. I see no objection, so we'll go on consent. Okay, we have one other bill, which is House Bill 1584. And Representative Schomburg, you passed out your amendment? Yes, uh, the OLS has not given us the unapproved draft yet, but this is the copies that was sent to them, and it's the ones with the the holes, punch holes in it. Do you all have that? Yeah, 
And there was also another copy, uh, left a, a single page copy from uh, uh, Commissioner Jasper. That was also the explanation. Oh. You know what? Um, there, there's, there's two amendments. Yes, the, the one, uh, I, I think it was a missed copy because they, they put every other page. They put pages one, three, five, and then left out two and four. That was the one. I'm sorry, Representative Mr. Chairman, Long. there was a set that was on when we came in this morning. There was a set that was on the desk, everybody's desk. Right. And then when our, our friend from over here came in, he replaced them with the, yeah, the ones they, with the holes. They didn't match up. They, they didn't oh. print all the pages. Oh. Yeah, they didn't print the backs they, of yeah, that, yeah, yes. The, the backs didn't get printed. Yeah, but also, the one you have now with the punch holes do. I'm also uh, reminded that Representative Aaron has an amendment, too. So, Her amendment. so we'll take up Representative Schomburger's amendment first. Uh, if you could explain. Well, uh, as you heard me in the public hearing end of this, uh, I'm a strong supporter of uh, county fairs. And th they draw people, they bring people into the community, they bring neighbors together, uh, especially in the, where I was from in the state of Ohio. And I, uh, the same thing happens here also. So in discussion, I had brought up to the commissioner of moving this to interim study. I didn't want to see it die. I wanted to see it just get, let's get the wording down. Let's get the objections uh, addressed. And the commissioner, he said that's like the kiss of death, the interim study. So uh, on Sunday night, I sent emails to two of the majority prime sponsors or to the prime sponsor and a person on the majority side and the email to the minority sponsor and a senator on the minority side asking them to contact someone from the majority side to see if they would do an interim study well with no reply I went to the association New Hampshire Fair Association and they contacted the commissioner and the commissioner on Thursday morning by uh, 11 o'clock, uh, emailed this to me. And I think it's a much better bill than what was initially proposed. Uh, it clears up a lot of questions. A and I was trying to find out from the commissioner why they changed as Representative Aaron, when she made up her amendment, why they went from 426 B to amend RSA 425 19-A and start from there. And 425 is under Title 40. It's the Agriculture, Horticulture, and Animal Husbandry, Chapter 425, the Department of Agricultural Markets and Food. It was a more, a more concise and uh, uh, proper area to have it in. And the commissioner makes the statement that he... Uh, says that they hadn't been using RSA 425.19 for who knows how long. And he said it'd be better just to replace all the wording with this amendment and move forward with the suggestions that he has presented. Um, I think that, that, that it is a better amendment and a better bill by being amended. Um, it, it addressed all the concerns that I had at the meeting. I don't know if it addressed Pres uh, Representative Abrami's question. I'm trying to find your question here, Representative Abrami, when we had the discussion. Um, the basic thing is that why is it in ways and means? Well, yeah, well. well the issue is going to become they have to get an appropriation of 250000 a year. That, that, that goes year to year. So Correct. Just, just, let's finance committee acts in funny ways, you know. 
for I have no problem with creating the structure, the fund. But then it's a crap to choose one. I, uh, <laughs> you know. Well, the, the capital improvement grant program fund, and I think that's a new fund. Can you turn your microphones on? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry, I was trying to get it moved out of the general fund into to one time uh, large grant that they could continue to use, but the commissioner totally rejected that. So, well, may maybe maybe I made other comments. I can't remember now. Uh, you know what I w recommend on this, since this has been dropped on us today. We really haven't had time to look at it. And over the weekend, look at it, and when we meet on Monday, uh, let's come up with your comments, and, and we should try to get the commissioner in here also on Monday. As long as we don't mix it with gummy bears on Monday, okay? Maybe. No, no, and, and, and I would take it up first. Thank you. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Also, this is now because it would stay as a general fund appropriation, something finance should have a say in. So either you're talking over the weekend. I'll, I'll talk to Karen. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Can we just hear briefly Representative Aaron's? Aaron's yeah, yeah Aaron. Representative Aaron, you want to go through your amendment? Your sure, sure, just briefly. Um, because after the bill was uh, um, introduced to our committee, uh, I, I and we had testimony on it, uh, afterwards during our lunch break, I uh, got a moment to sit down with um, Commissioner Jasper and asked him, um, because some of the questions that came up was regarding putting a cap on that fund. We didn't want to continually be putting money in that where it accumulated and accumulated. And he said to me he was fine if we put a million dollar cap on this fund. Um, so that's what I wrote up in the first section of this amendment. And the last section of this amendment, um, I had also spoken to Commissioner Jasper regarding uh, his, um, the possibility of him doing some sort of annual reporting so I thought that you know it was reasonable to ask him to do to submit a report uh, annually, which would detail the amount of the allocations that receive that they received and what entities received the allocations, and the purposes of the funds, how how they were used, and he was fine with that and and suggested to me that the report should go to the president of the Senate, the chairpersons of the House and Senate Ways and Means Committee probably should be finance. I said the House and si Senate Finance Committees as well, and the House and Senate Committees with jurisdiction over environmental and agricultural issues. And that should be done one annually, say in November. So that was the gist of the section, the second section. What I'd like to do is um, incorporate those ideas into uh, what Representative Schomburg has presented. And I think it's a very good idea to insert this in Chapter 425 of the statutes because that deals with fund distributions to agricultural fairs. Okay. So it makes sense to me. All right, so uh, if you would do that. Okay. Sure. <laughs> and then we will. Uh, we both agree. <laughs> take yeah. this up on, on uh, Monday. All righty. And I'll try to, uh, I'll get a hold of Karen and see if we get finance participation. They also, they're also going to be meeting. They're also going to be meeting at the same time, unfortunately. What's, what's that? They're going to be meeting at the same time, so but it's going to be a little difficult. But we, we can work that out. Um, now, let me ask the committee what we have left is 1598 plus this one. 
we're going to deal with on Monday. I left it so that we could Sunday. meet this afternoon, but I, I, do you think you've heard enough? And then we'll continue the work session on 1598 on Monday. Rep Representative. Thank you. I think that uh, we need to see the full amendment that needs to come in from uh, yes. from Representative yes. Lang before we can really go any further. We've we've beat the original bill to death a as amended. So uh, I think we, once we get this amendment in, we make the comparison to what was and what is. We know what we need to do. Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> Very yeah. important. Yeah. Um, Representative Lang, how long do you think it will take you to go through? Uh, going through it's going to be really quick. Having the conversation after we go through it might well, be a little bit more difficult so yeah, that, again, we've already identified at least two items that I, in my amendment I have to go get redrafted. Uh, one is the 15 cultivators. Two is the eight months uh, for rulemaking. So I already know I need to change that. Why don't you pass uh, out the amendment? Okay. And let's go through it think, quickly. Okay. And then we can chew on it over the weekend. Uh, Riffs and Major. Yes. I really need to have a discussion about this idea of spreading it to every small farm that might grow a patch of marijuana. Uh, it, I think if you're going to do that, we at least need, I don't know if they're allowed to get involved with this, but ask the, the New Hampshire Extension Service. Yeah, UNH Extension. To, to comment about whether this is at all feasible. It is an annual crop. It, it is highly uh, vulnerable to droughts, to floods, to bad harvesting, to <laughs> the quality is the first thing in marijuana sales. Representative Ames? Well, I don't understand much about this, but my understanding is that a lot of cannabis is cultivated indoor, indoors, under lights. Uh, anywhere in a house would be fine. Um, so when we talk about small cultivators in the c marijuana context, we're not talking about the traditional small farmer, I don't think. Well, well he we might was. Be. <laughs> Representative Bromney, okay. Let, let's go. I so know. Yeah. back to the Marijuana Commission. Guess who was in the room a lot in our meetings? Farmers. Uh, there's nothing in the bill that says it has to be grown inside or outside. Uh, there's no restrictions on it. It's a restriction of the 15, which I think we heard we have to lift that because let the marketplace. Yeah. And what when, and I had a hallway conversation with the commissioner, uh, and I, he did touch on this, that in Maine, the, the yes. liquor commissioner, yeah. So the liquor commissioner said, and he's been doing his homework a bit here, and he, he checked what's going on in Maine. And there are a lot of farm first, but what they do is they put these, uh, we have a lot of that going on in New Hampshire too. There, there's the one place where in Loudoun that grows lettuce and greens and things. But it's, but it's in the, um, you know, in the thin plastic, right. So that's what you see a lot of, I think that's what he was talking about. That's the way to do it, so you can get more than more, one crop a year, yeah. so I, and I, to me, the way the bill is written, and I, obviously we can amend it to a degree, but but that's kind of you know the crossover of the policy and our policy, where we're gonna we're gonna say I, I think we're gonna amend out the 15 because it, 15 is ridiculous for the number of stores, so that'll impact revenues because we're gonna we're gonna constrain the amount of supply. Could I ask you a question? I'm I'm not sure. I still don't understand why we. If supply chain is a potential issue, why aren't we growing our own in a very controlled environment? That wasn't, okay. That well, wasn't. I mean, to me, it just seems like the logical way to go in a vertically integrated system. You grow your own greenhouses, under lights, whatever it is. Right, right. Yeah, I so, understand that, but I'm just right. thinking about the control factor right. coming from 15 or 20 right. or 50 different farms. From a, from a true recreation model um, with commercialization, a commercialization model. Most of these companies are bigger. And they have vertical integration, and they make money all over every step of the way, from from growing to to manufacturing to retail. Here, we're actually putting our we, if we had that kind of model in the state, we, I think we could make a lot more money. Mm -hmm. Here, I'm agreeing with you okay. that 
that we're not we're not going to make any money on the on the cultivation and if manufacturing comes back into this bill we're not going to make anything on manufacturing because those are going to be private business but this is the bill that was handed to us no, I understand you know, it, but I just and don't this is and now that's a major amendment to say oh no and he, he's going to say we have no expertise in this is what the commission is but it's it's hard enough for him to do what he's about to do just do the retail because basically in his business he they have great experts at buying things but other manufacturers are doing all of that I, I just think about you know medicines in general if you bring in a product from all over the world that isn't controlled how do you control the end product? That's why, I, to me, it's more of a question of just the logic of having multiple little farms versus growing your own under control, regulated to get the, the same product day in and day out. Right, but it's it's going to be more than little farms. It's going to be no, no, big. I, I, I mean, it's right. going to be, and if if a, if a small farmer wants to give a crack at it, you know, there'll be a license fee to do yeah. it. It, it. They can compete with everybody else, but. But you're right about the quality testing. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, I, I'm just trying to say, you know, let the market, in, in the Marijuana Commission, we said let the marketplace sort that all out. And, and we had a long conversation about this, believe me. Let, because we, we talked about limitations on growers, mm -hmm. you know, and all that. And we said, no, you know something? Like any other new product, it's going to start here in terms of the numbers and eventually come down. It sounds like in Mass and in Maine, it's growing still. So, I don't know. We have to remember that the policy has been set two to one by the full house. And we ha have to concentrate only on the revenue part of it. We can't change the policy. Rep Representative Nunes. Representative Almy, I I'd like to address your question about, um, if I may, Mr. Chair, yes. uh, about the way that it grows. Uh, we had uh, testimony, and fortunately, I have a little bit of experience in my background with this. Uh, we had testimony from the, f the folks from the ATCs who uh, talked about the fact that sometimes they turn over three to four crops per year. Inside. Okay, it's uh, in, but you wouldn't want to grow this outside because if it was outside, then people could come onto your property and take it, and you have better security if it's inside. If it's in a grow house, in a plastic grow house, you can provide all the security you need to that grow house to make sure that uh, your product is, is secure and safe and quality and used uh, without pesticides and things of that nature. Can, can I just, uh, could I just say something to that? On, I think if we put into here something which may be policy, but it also quality is revenue this in, in this case. Otherwise, they're gonna, they're gonna, our people are gonna continue going to Massachusetts. On uh, that, if we put something in that said that it shall only be grown inside, I don't know exactly how you'd say inside, then that will make it incredibly easier for this um, negotiant or whatever his, name, his title is. Uh, to actually produce decent quality and c and consistent quality. You say it's under the UV lights. Under the lights. Under under the under well under the lights. It could be outside if you're willing to only do two crops a year, uh, but on at least on th at that way you aren't worrying about drought. You aren't worrying about about animals coming in and defecating on it. You Mr. are Chairman. about all sorts of things. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman and Representative Almy, bef before I was a legislator, I worked with the U.S. Virgin Islands, helping them craft their medical marijuana policy and how they would grow it on the island. And of course, there they have 12 full hours of sun every day. Yeah. And uh, many, of their, um, many of their crops are grown outdoors because they have the sunlight uh, and the, the needed sunlight that it takes in order to grow a crop and turn over a crop more than once annually. Uh, and um, having said that, in a grow house or in a, in a, in a greenhouse, you would put up um, a hoop house with uh, yeah. you know, plastic over it. You can control uh, the amount of crop, what you're going to deliver for crops, uh, whatever you determine, three to four a year. Sometimes you can get four. I know you can get three. Um, indoors inside a, a greenhouse 
Uh, so with lights. With, uh, with, with lights, yes. Yeah. With lights and sometimes without lights. I mean, you don't have to have the lights on yeah, all the time. In the middle of summer. Yes, yes. So just talk about pesticide, Joel, for some kidding. Okay, hold on. Now. Mr. Right. Chair, if I may. Representative Aaron and Representative mm -hmm. Lyon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'm kind of confused about <coughs> the point where we talk about we're only looking at the financial aspects of this bill and not the policy aspects. And yet, much of the policy aspects really has a big bearing on the financial aspects because here we're talking about, well, uh, do we make changes to make this more profitable for the state, such as adding edibles? Do we make uh, changes to how many suppliers we can specify and how many licenses the state can yeah. provide. So I, I do think to some extent that we are making some sort of alterations to policy in order to make this work financially. Is that true? Okay. It's going to be difficult to separate the two, but the edibles has been, has been debated and it's been excluded. But the number of suppliers, I think, we could change that. So um, continue if you've got more questions. Um, no, I, I'm just I, I'm just sort of struggling with this issue of um, separating out policy from the finances because they are so much inter intertwined, and we do yes. want to make this craft this <coughs> any amendments to make this bill stronger in terms of the argument that this is going to be. Uh, a, a worthwhile financial endeavor for the state to embark upon. Right, and I, I agree. For the state to make more money, edibles should be in there. Mm -hmm. But I think the policy has been set on that. Uh, Representative Lang. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I, I guess I'd like to get into the amendment so everyone can take it home and read it for the so weekend, it. but I will just make this statement. For me, the underlying policy was legalization. So that's the what, that's the policy. Everything else is the how, and the how is up to us to a certain extent. That's, that's the way point. I view this, that's is that point. the what is fine. We've legalized it. Now the question is, how do we go about doing that? And that has revenue implications, and that's why we can have discussions around how many cultivators there are and those kind of things, and it gets to the, to the how. So that's the way I view this, and that's why in drafting some of this stuff, I'm, I'm looking at it that way. I like that. So if I get into the amendment, so everybody can kind of get yes. a sense of what it looks like. So there were some significant changes. Yes. Um, so I'm going to start on the first real change is on page five of the amendment. Um, so I have a I already have the drafted change. Page five, line 28. Uh, this is about the regulations. And to Representative Ames' point, I added the word licensure on line 30, and I have a new amendment version going in that'll change. Sorry, a little slower. I apologize. Okay, we're on page five. He doesn't see it. Page five, line. Can you get backwards? Staple yeah, yeah, they the OLS, the Health Committee Services, stapled it backwards. So, apologize for that. Although it does make it easy to read. Um, right, so page five. Yeah, well, and you're and you're reading forward. So. <laughs> yes. Backwards. <laughs> so, so at page five, so if you pull up page five, we're on line 28. So based on the committee conversation today, I'm going to change that December 1, for, uh, December 1, 2022 to read eight months after the passage of this bill. So it gives the committee, so once the governor signs it, the clock starts ticking. They have eight months from whatever that date is. That's line 28, where it says December 1st, 22. I'm going to change that, take the date out, and say no later than eight months after the passage of this bill. The next change was on 30. So we aren't going to discuss any of it now. I think we're going to discuss it on Monday. I think I'm just trying to get it to everybody so everybody can know what the changes are and... Take up to 10 months, and we don't want to just 
And we'll, dis we'll discuss the, the length on Monday. On line 30, at Representative Ames' request, we added registration, licensure, and regulation. So I added the word licensure in there. Do it again. On line 30, page 5, line 30, number, Roman numeral number 1, it says we added the word licensure before, it's, before it just said registration and regulation, and we added regulation, uh, registration, licensure, and right, regulation. Did, right. And this, this was from the subcommittee. We, that yeah. was from the subcommittee. Right. That was a request for Representative That's why Ames. It's over there. Right. Um, what else? Where do I go next? The next one is on page seven, and this is a mistake that drafting is fixing. Uh, so it'll come out in the new bill. On line number three of page seven, Roman numeral four, six there, um, what that meant to say, but they made it that the ATCs become retail stores, and that wasn't what we intended. <laughs> um, what we intended to do was to allow the ATCs to be able to get a parallel license for cultivation, uh, manufacture, and um, transportation of cannabis so that they could sell to the state. Because under the current rules, they can't do that, so we have to amend the law to allow them to be able to sell to the state because of their not-for-profit status. So we have What to line did it. you just stick that in? That is, well, it's, it's going to show up in, on Wrong. page 7, line 3, Wrong Roman there, numeral somewhere. 6. It says, the alternative treatment center is registered to operate under pursuant to RSA, blah, blah, blah. This says that uh, shall obtain a separate registration to operate a cannabis establishment pursuant to this chapter. And yet, we meant to say they could be cultivators, um, manufacturers, and um, delivery agents. So that was in response to their concern about being harmed, and you were going to say, if, if they said that if they could sell as well, then that wouldn't hurt their ATC therapeutic model, correct? It was an olive branch, yes. Right, the, okay. It was an olive branch to that organization to give them an ever, another revenue stream to keep them healthy. Right, okay. They actually had no position, so it's, uh, it's my understanding on that. Right. Correct. I mean, I, I, Oh, can I? Well, right, right, right. Uh, but we'll talk from Monday. We can talk about Monday. So, that if we go over to page eight, so this is where the banking language was originally in this bill, and we struck all of the banking language that was originally put into the bill. However, we did add some language in here about banking, and one of it had to do with um, if you look at line 18. Um, the big thing is we just we talk about having to separate the funds from cannabis from all other state funds. So if something happens, we're not putting the entire general fund at risk um, somehow because it's commingled monies. Um, and so it talks about the fact that the, um, the monies be accredited to a fund that will be held distinct and separate from all other funds um, under the straight treasurer's control. So is that a one a at Roman? That's one a. a. Okay. The cannabis control fund. Correct. Under under yeah, starting on line eighteen, number one. Uh, a, the, the language is we added some language in there just to keep the funds separate. And you got this language from the from the New Hampshire Bankers Association. From the, from the association. And I ran it by the Liquor Commission. They were completely okay with it. Right. Okay. And then is, B is, is also there a mechanism to take money out of there for the state if there's ever enough money. Beyond we'll get there. The, the disbursements the a little operation. bit later in the amendment. Um, the second line again is is just some banking language to clean up. Um, to make sure the state's doing it right. We talked about we, the FinCEN right. and the okay, go, uh, help Page what? What line again? We're on the same page. Page 8, the next section, B. B. Oh, Notwithstanding any provision right. of law or contrary financial institutions with a branch within the state. So again, minor banking language. It again was from the New Hampshire Banking Association that would clean up the language. And also I ran this by Liquor Commission and they were okay with it. Okay. Now we get into a disbursement of funds from this fund. Um, so where is that? The same same page. We're at line. We're, at, we're going to start at line number thirty. And I just want to have before we start reading the actual bill, I want to tell you exactly what I did, and then I'll show you how the chat how it plays out. Under the original bill, the first disbursement we made was to pay back the taxpayers for the startup costs. Um, the little bit of problem with that is that they need to be able to operate. So if it didn't take enough money in, and we used all the money to pay back the state, they had no money to run the rest of the stores for any time. So I inverted number one and two, and I said the first thing they do is get to take their operational, operation expenses out, then they'll pay back the, the citizens. Uh, we're, at, we're on page eight, line 30. 
30, and I'm just reading it, it'll start, it'll, it, it all runs right starting at 30, everything I'm saying will run down from there onto page nine. But I just wanna have, explain what I did so you don't have to read every language, we can fix the language later if you don't like it. Um, so the first thing I did was invert the payment to the citizens, the general fund back for the startup cost with the operating cost. So the first line is they get to take their operating costs out which allows them to be able to use that as a revolving fund to be able to add funds into their operational expenses to open the next store and so they can get to their stores without having to take another loan from the state to open more stores. So they can use their operating revenues to be able to slowly roll out more stores after the initial expenditure. I did put um, at the re uh, recommendation of OLS that they have a five year timeline to pay back the citizens. So they have five years to pay back the money that we use to give, we give them to start the, uh, start the ball rolling. And that's in line, um, that's on line 35, no later than June 30th, 2027, the commission shall reimburse the general fund. So again, it's a no later than, so that if they get all their stores up in three years, and the next year they have, they're flush with cash, they can pay the whole thing off in the fourth year and it's done, but they have to have it done by the fifth year. And, and can I interject, so Mr. Chair, so you did this because they, they requested, well in the bill it was 14 million, Actually, they, the Liquor Commission thought it should have been even more. 14 million now became 5 million or 4 point whatever. And that, that, uh, and that the only way we can finance the new stores was to do this, to give them time to pay back the initial loan. Basically. Right, and it gives them, lets them use their operating revenue that they create right. to be able to open more stores until we right. get the full 10 and then we're at our full-blown $50 million or whatever, $330 million in revenue, and they'll easily be able to pay the citizens back. Right. But it was a, it's like any startup business, right? You gotta have some revenue coming in if you wanna grow. You know, so we gotta give them that ability to grow to get where, where they need to be. Um, so that's that, as we roll into page eight now, or nine. So in the first two sections on, on uh, page eight, we allow them to, take out their operating page expense nine. and then pay back to state within five years. Now nine. we have what I consider the, we had the gross net, which is what we were talking about there. Now we come to the net net. Um, this is after we've taken the operational expense out, any monies that we decide to pay back to the general fund, we have this new revenue that total. And um, uh, so from that revenue total, the net net, 50% um, um, of those of the funds that are left will go to offset the, the $363 million we raised for the SWEP tax. Line three, right? I'm sorry? Line three. Starting at line three, yes, I'm sorry. Yep, line three, page nine. So 50% of the remaining balance will be dispersed annually to the Department of Revenue to be dispersed to cities and towns to offset the educational property tax imposed by on persons, blah, blah, blah. So again, the idea is that, I'll use some simple round numbers. If we had $50 million we would take $25 million, and we would immediately lower what was needed to be raised by taxation from swept from $363 million down to $363 minus $25 million. So we raise less money on the individual citizens that on the prop on the swept property tax line. Just just a note, because we'll be discussing this on Monday, that I do not think that's a wise allocation. Um, it skews heavily towards the property wealthy towns, uh, Moultonboro will get gobs of cash, and uh, Charlestown and Jaffrey will get very little. Okay, so we can have that comment. I knew, we were, I knew that was gonna be a conversation point, uh, uh, but again, that's, that's. So, so we can talk, I, I actually don't know the numbers. I don't, what, we were, Representative Ames and I talked about this. I don't wanna get bogged down in the conversation, but I'm a little confused how that plays out a little bit myself. Well, um, well, so we can me, talk about that later. Let me stop this right now. We're here to listen to where the changes are and what they are, and then so that we can understand these over the weekend and come back Monday and then move our questions and comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the next change is we allocated 30% of the net net to pay off the New Hampshire retirement system debt to try to expedite that faster, um, which would be a huge benefit to our cities and towns if we can get there quicker. Um, less, less interest we pay on that debt, the more, and immediately both the towns and the employees would see a benefit because their 
percentage of retirement costs would drop and th that would result in more money in their paycheck versus going to retirement. So we allocated 30% of those funds that are remaining to go to the New Hampshire retirement system debt specifically. And once we pay off that debt, the re that 30% will go directly to the education trust fund. The next item is 10% or $25 million, whichever is less. So if we get to the point where we're making 200 or $300 million in net, net which would be great, um, uh, DHHS, would, the cessation programs, would be held to a $25 million cap. Um, but we also allow it, so as the program ramps up, DHHS, in theory, would have more need, and therefore they would get more money. As the program ramps up, the money to DHHS would ramp up. The last two items, the last two 5% are 5% will go to public safety agencies. Again, the anticipation here is things like Police Standards and Training Council would be able to offer drug recognition expert classes to allow law enforcement officers to better understand what does dr drugged driving look like um, and be able to recognize those kind of symptoms and the problems that are coming up. Um, and the last one is 5%, which is the last 5% of the net net. Uh, shall be dispersed to the Department of Health and Human Services Behavioral Health um, Bureau of Children Children's Behavioral Health to be and used. This for is why we need finance with us on Monday. Right. So, and I ran these again. I ran all of this by finance, um, and they actually really loved the idea. We were giving the Hampshire Retirement System money to pay that debt off faster. Um, Can I ask a question. Uh, just a clarification question. So, if you've just allocated 100 percent. Where's the money to open a new store? So that's the net net. So we talked about gross net at the top. We start with the gross net, which is $50 million if we use their original numbers. Okay. Right. The first thing we take out of that is their operating expense. The second thing we take out of that, any, any dollar amount they want to use to pay off the startup. And now you're left with the net net. Now we're doing percentage of that net net. Could I just ask on that, I thought that what you did was stop taking out money for the new stores after night after uh, 27. No, they have to pay back the startup costs to the to the general fund by 2027. But then anything that they want to keep to open new stores, which is something we've seen a lot with liquor, that they that our revenues go down because they they open new stores. So if I may, it's the way I understand we do current liquor stores is that they do it out of their operating costs. So they don't they yeah. collect their revenue and then they project out we want to open this store, it's gonna we're gonna charge this expense and it would go to their operating expenses. So it would yeah. come out of the first line when they open a store, it's gonna be part of the operating expenses they're deducting out of the gross net. Exactly. But it does continually come out of we will discuss that on Monday. The next change is on page nine, line 33, and this is where we had the act, the, just a typo. They had um, temporary investigators, something like that, and I changed it yeah. to market consultants on line 33. And that is the... Negotiant. The negotiant, yes. yes. Do you want to use that term? Do yeah. you want to use negotiant? No, they, they wanted well, market consultants. Actually, they were okay with that. Actually, negotiant was apparently all, all, also doing all of the... the uh, visiting of the farms and making sure that that their quality was sufficient again the marketing consultants may do all of that that's within oh, whatever yes. so the, all the bill does is allow them to create an rfp to say we want to we want a market consultant and they can define within the market consultant what all the conditions and scope okay. of work is okay. so Go ahead. um where else am i here uh Actually, I'm pretty close to done, Mr. Chair. I think the only thing I have left to change is on page 10, and this is based on the conversation we had here on line number 26, and that's the 15, uh, the limit on the 15 <coughs> cultivation, um, cannabis cultivators facilities. So I'll strike that language if everyone's in agreement with that and leave it for the free market where, to be able to adapt and adjust. It's on line 26. 26. On page Nice. And I believe that is it. I will say there was one question that was brought up, and this is about the underlying, and this is a policy question I got to get answered. Um, there was a question on whether or not the language that the Criminal Justice Committee did accidentally re-legalized re edibles. 
and I'm going to try and get an answer to that question. But I think they, in trying to clean up do with the language, they somehow undid the other language we did in previous years when we decriminalized certain things. And they, I think when they did their edit, they might have added it back in. So I'm going to look at that, and I'll talk to the chairman of criminal right. justice to confirm right. that and take care of that down. M Mr. Chairman, if yes. I may, that was brought to us by HHS. Uh, the, 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 uh, our visitor and subcommittee from HHS said that, that this bill may, may strike our current decrim law, and the last thing that we want to do is strike out anything that would hurt decrim on the edible side, on, the, on, on, on that side that may not be coming into our store. We don't want to step on that law. Right. So, Mr. Chair, one last thing, if I can just run through the numbers, considering that's probably the thing we hear most important about based on the conversations we had with the commissioner, mm -hmm. so people can write down the numbers and see if they all, we can all agree on what a fiscal outlook looks like for this thing. Mm -hmm. So I'm using, I'm basing everything off, we all have this form that was given to us by the commission itself that has the revenues on it. It's about the third or fourth paragraph down where they estimated that based on the, ten, the, the New Hampshire would have about $250 million in gross revenue for the state. That gross revenue number would turn into approximately $50 million in, net re in, in gross net revenue to the, ta to the state to spend. Um, but we also know that of that $50 million, um, that included edibles in their projections. And no, that's no longer in there. So out of that $50 million, you got to strike 40% or 20 Revenue coming in to the state. We also know that we're going to be rolling these stores out slowly, um, roughly one third a year. Um, so for the first year, full operating year, we expect the revenue to be ten million dollars, one third of the thirty million dollars. So our income in the first year, first full calendar year of operations with one third of the stores open should be around ten million dollars. Um, we know on the cost side of this that they estimated the annual cost for 10 stores um, was 10 stores and the personnel was $8.5 million. Um, we have to divide that by one third per year, roughly. Um, so I was trying to get to the, finish up that math. Um, so it's one third of $8.5 million. So again, even in the first year, taking in $10.5 million, um, their costs are only gonna be around roughly $3 million. So we'll see revenue generation to the state uh, on, an, on a uh, gross net level, so what, what they can actually um, or distribute to towns and cities of around um, $3 million or, or so um, for the startup. That's after with just three stores open and then those numbers will, I'm sorry, I apologize, the number is $10.5 million in the first year. Um, and that number will grow as the stores grow. So I just want to give you some basic numbers where we're at. Even in the first year, they should be profitable with 30 stores and give them enough money to start rolling it back into the agency to be able to open the other stores. Hey, Tim, would you put that into a... Uh, I will put it into an email and distribute it to the entire committee. We'll do. Uh, there is one um, other thing on revenues. Uh, yeah. <laughs> one other thing on revenues that Daryl Abbas emailed me yesterday, and he sent a copy to Fred Gissette and, and Tim Lang. I, probably you haven't got the chance. I got it this morning, but I'll take a look at it and see how his numbers compare to everything and else we talked I'm about. I'm going to forward that to all the members. Uh -huh. And uh, it was an analysis done for Massachusetts in order to come up with numbers for New Hampshire. And uh, why don't you take a look at that? I'll get that out to you today. But they come out 40 to $50 million. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Chair, could I just say one last thing? Yes. Thank you. So this isn't necessarily a ways and means thing, but again, I, I look at this in this conversation about we have the, the what and the how. And for me, the what is the most important conversation we're having, and the how just gets us there, right? And when I say that, what I mean is legalization to me is the most important thing, and I am holding my nose when I vote for this thing. I, I, I'm not, don't necessarily like the way it's done at all, but... My ultimate goal is to stop arresting our citizens, stop crim get making criminals out of our citizens for this product, which I don't think is any more dangerous than beer or wine. And actually, I'd argue it's probably less dangerous than beer and wine, um, considering the number of domestics I've been as a police officer for beer and wine compared to marijuana, which was zero. 
Um, and so I, I don't want everybody to get caught up, right, in, in arguing over the how, right? We, we got to get, if, we, if our goal, if we are, a goal is to achieve legalization and to stop arresting our citizens, stop incarcerating our citizens, stop making criminals out of our citizens, it's going to involve compromise. We're going to have to hold our nose and vote for something. I'm going to hold my nose and vote for this when we get to a final things, even if we decide to change the financial makeup from what I suggested. I'll hold my nose and I'll vote for it because, again, it's the what. That's the most important thing. Stop arresting our citizens. Stop making criminals out of our citizens. And let's move forward. Uh, right. And myself, personally, I would have to hold my nose twice <laughs> because by doing this, you're telling our youth this is perfectly acceptable. And I don't think anybody here that's a parent would want to encourage their kids to use marijuana or, or these edibles. But our job here is because the policy was set, we need to look at this bill from a financial aspect make it as good as we can for the state of New Hampshire and, and not exceed uh, what's not in there. And then bring it to the floor. I probably, well, anyway, I'll, I'll make my mind up then. But, but we need to do our job, make it as best as we can with good revenue projections. You had something to say? Well, I mean, we are the Howe Committee, even though, Tim, you're right, the, the, the criminal justice was the other committee that said, this is the policy. And sure, decriminaliza decriminalization of, the, of it was part of their reasoning. But we're, we're, that's what we do, how, And we are fixing the bill. So um, the, I do have one other comment about the edibles, is that one other thing we have to address, I think, I think the chair made it clear that we're not going to put edibles back in. But the one thing about edibles we have to discuss, I still think, is whether they should be sold to, oh, why do we have it in there that ATC, ATC patients with a card can go in and expect to see ed edibles? That's, that's a ridiculous situation. I should have asked the commission. I talked to them offline about this. So how does that work? How do we how do we have uh, edibles on the shelves, but most of their customers coming in, so we can't can't have those. So I think we should take the ATC portion out of it um, in terms of uh, as an alternative because it's going to hurt the ATCs too. Is, is it, did I say that clearly? <laughs> Yes, I, I completely understand what you're saying, and I completely, you know, we had this conversation in the subcommittee. We have basically three options. We remove the medical edibles, and they're not there. We leave them in there, or we just barge ahead and leave recreational edibles and put recreational edibles in. I will tell you the last one's a showstopper for some, for some people in this process um, as it moves through the, the legislative process. So... Um, What's a showstopper? Do it again. I'm sorry. Having recreational edibles yeah. in the state oh, stores a showstopper yeah, for a show. for uh, somewhere in the other two pieces of chain. This has to go, um, and so uh, again, <laughs> um, so again, you know, whether we include recreational or medicinal is the question, right? And and I can have when I finish getting the final draft, I can have them draft two versions: one striking medical and one leaving medical in, and we can choose between those two. Uh, versions. Or if we could just have a straw vote right now. Do you want to have a discussion? Yeah. Straw vote. Oh, yeah. What's that? Straw vote right now. Somebody's just have a straw vote right now to see if we're mostly on the same page about that. So I, I just have one. If we're going to do that, I just have a statement. I, w I would have waited till Monday, but. Oh. We're going to wait till Monday. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Can I? As to revenue questions about edibles. One is when you went into subcommittee, we had 50% edibles and for the revenues. Now it's 40%. And um, we did have those main people uh, who were here who explained something that I thought was perfectly reasonable that 
they take the lower quality marijuana that that they grow that doesn't work quite, and those go into the edibles, which would increase the decrease about the which would make it more than the 40%. I don't know where the 40% came from. I'd just like to know. If I may, uh, so that originally started from Re uh, Representative Abrami gave us uh, in, in um, the committee from the original bill when we were having a conversation. He had gone online and did some research. And I, I think actually we're, we're goofing now that I'm thinking about it because as the commissioner said, vaping isn't considered an edible. Right, so that was 26% I took out uh, to get to the 40% 40, 40 so I, other, then the question becomes, it's 18 so vaping, edibles and ingestibles were 18 or 20%. Is, vaping and ointments are not edibles. Right, not exactly. So uh, you'd allow pre-rolls, accessories, topicals, flour, cartridges and concentrates. The only thing you wouldn't allow was basically gummies and cookies and brownies. So <laughs> you, better, you better do is double check with the, uh, the, the, the hidden person there because uh, exactly we're, 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 we're kind of grouped in edibles and ingestibles with some of these other you know the pre-rolls which are a big thing now people don't want to roll their own they, they buy them already and they're all consistently done uh, accessories is not a big the topicals which is very minor it's just something that you put on your arm you know and it absorbs through the skin it's more medical though. right flour is tr traditional that's the loose marijuana that you roll your own and then cartridges is a big thing which is, you know, it's it's the vaping devices that that have marijuana, you know, it's a T, a THC in them, and then the concentrates are fourteen percent. That that that's according to this study, uh, this report that I found. So so what do we? I think the bill needs to. Well, we should define the stuff in the bill in a way uh, as to what we're talking about, because concentrates, and I'm sure the cartridge manufacturers make cart cartridges. Concentrates are they extract the stuff out of the out of the flower and they create and probably the stem too. I think when I reread the bill, that's what I realized actually the vaping cartridges were allowed even though we took them out in our financial calculations thinking how much it was gonna be. But in the bill itself it doesn't actually prohibit it. And so it just it, it, it prohibits edibles, which I mean that you know what you take orally. But then right. it gets a little so convoluted. But then we need manufacturers who are going to come in and ma manufacture certain things. So we're going to say, well, we're going to try to attract manufacturers to manufacture the cartridges for us. Right. You know what I mean? That's I, I don't quite know how that works, but uh, you know, usually they'll, they'll manufacture everything. The way I look at it, it's, uh, it's, it'd be like any other supply chain, right? If I go to a store, I may not buy everything the store sells, but I'm going to uh, well, take well, what I want. So if a manu we have a manufacturer's license or in this case, we're gonna allow the ATCs to sell, so they may r ramp up their vaping side of their cartridges and not touch their gummy bears, right? B their gummies, because um, they, don't, they know they don't have a state outlet for that, so, but they do have a state outlet for cartridges, so they're gonna ramp hey, up. Okay. Excuse me. Okay, uh, 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 Representative I've Bernstein that. wants to say something followed by Representative Spilsberg. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, we, we are, um, there's a lot to consider over the weekend. And there's been some people sitting in the room all morning with some a lot of expertise, and I, I would love to let them briefly, perhaps give us more to think about over the weekend and hear some comments, if, if you will, if with the indulgence of the chair. It, it Does anybody there have comments that they want to share with the committee? Okay. I'll, can I ask him one question? Well, anybody else out there? Uh, I think the bank is going to disappear. Yeah. Uh, they, they, but they came up with the language that's in the bill for the oh. uh, rise down. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that was pretty standard to me. Rep Representative Spilsbury. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, before we get into the uh, delve down other paths I just I, I don't know whether this is really important to say or not but philosophically one thing I think we should all be baking into our thinking over the weekend is that um, I think as legislators we're accustomed to work in a domain 
of regulation and fees and taxes and try to create a structure with uncertain uh, with a lot of certainty or as much as we can anticipate but we're dealing with a situation here also where we're we're creating an enterprise and an enterprise requires a lot of flexibility and freedom uh, trial and error uh, learning through the process uh, entrepreneurial spirits and so on so the bill has to be find the balance between creating a regulatory regime that doesn't go off the rails, but also allowing enough flexibility in the operating uh, environment to actually compete, to price, uh, to work out relationships. Uh, and I, I think uh, the takeaways, for example, from uh, the, the fellows from Maine who testified is uh, in, in the practical reality of running an enterprise uh, there are a lot of decisions that may be made on the fly, may be made to adjust from experience, and so let's not tighten it down so hard that that can't happen. Representative Tucker? This is a really boring <coughs> question, but uh, the Coas County delegation is going to vote on its annual budget on Monday. So could you tell me what your plan is for next week? You're not going to exec until Wednesday? What I was hoping, but it, 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 that may not happen. I was hoping that we could exec on Monday. I mean, I'm happy to give but up going to the annual budget, but I need to be able to tell the chairman. After this discussion, I think we're going to spend a long time Monday ironing these things out. But Monday, we're going to take care of House Bill 1584 first. It shouldn't take long. And after we take care of that, then we'll spend the rest of the time on Monday. And if we're not satisfied, then on Wednesday, we will exec. But if you are satisfied, you would you exec on Monday? Yes. OK, so I'll be here then. Great. Mr. Chair. I don't want to miss the executive of this bill. Okay. So that's my time. And I priority. can't promise that that's going to happen. I understand. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Representative Lyon. I just want to say anybody who has, after reading the amendment over the weekend, has suggestions or changes, especially if they're just simple changes, if you can get them to me so that on Monday I can actually have a, a draft you know, of the minor changes that we, we all see or, or feel. Um, and then it'll give us a better starting point rather than trying to merge them all together in the middle of a 20 person. I'm sorry, say that again? You'll have fresh copies of this. I will have fresh copies because I already know we've made two or three changes just in our conversations today from what I had put in. So if you have more uh, that are, are the cleanup language or that kind of thing, just please email me and I'll try to get them into OLS so that on Monday when we go to meet, we have a nice clean copy with all suggested amendments. And Representative Aaron and Representative South uh, Schramberg <laughs> will get their amendments squared away. OK, good. Okay. Representative Almy. Thank you. I mean, we did this a little while ago, and I was trying to on Representative uh, Knark, who is head of the ATC Oversight Committee has told me that they are totally opposed to vaping. So don't and confirm that if you want. I don't know if anybody's here. Um, but otherwise, don't put that in. And um, I hope we're going to get all of this emailed to us so that we can print it out and figure out what, for instance, what the numbers are, because it looked to me like it, part of it was backwards, <laughs> and I just probably wasn't following it. Representative Bromney. I think, I think Mr. Simon can. I think Mr. Simon can help us with one or two things while he's here. I think we should take advantage of that. Okay. Do you want to represent? Do you want to start with Representative Bromney's question? Uh, yes, right. thank you. Uh, just to clarify, the Medical Oversight Board, I've attended all of their meetings. Uh, they did adopt a formal position, which, if I may try to replicate it off the top of my head, was 
any adult use, any legalization bill to do adult use cannabis uh, should be evaluated on, on the basis of its impacts on the therapeutic cannabis program. Uh, that program is important and needs to be maintained. That's the only formal position the Medical Oversight Board has taken. I know that some of the uh, medical professionals on that board have personally strong feelings about vaping, uh, but that has not been discussed at any of the public meetings, and they have not taken a position that I'm aware of on that. Okay, but I do not think you should be trying to say that they should start selling vaping products without talking to them. <laughs> and do you have it? answers to any other? Yeah, I was going to comment on a couple other things. Thank you. Uh, for the record, Matt Simon representing Prime ATC, uh, and I thank you again for your time on Monday. I'm encouraged by a lot of the things I'm hearing overall. Uh, uh, I was encouraged by the Liquor Commissioner's testimony saying that we need more cultivation licenses because, as I said on Monday, this is not going to be a successful market if you only have a very small number of cultivators. and. Uh, so that's, in, that's all very encouraging. Um, I would reiterate that our position on the bill is opposed as currently written, and we will have to evaluate this amendment and have attorneys look at it before we can get back to you with and a position on it. What's the opposite? Why are you opposing it? Well, we are supportive of legalization, and we've supported other legalization bills. Uh, certainly note HB 629 has already passed the House, so when we talk about stopping arrests, the House has already passed a bill uh, that does that. So I think this is something entirely different, and we believe that to create a market for cannabis uh, is something that should be done thoughtfully and deliberately and with a great knowledge base. And I think the bills that were based on the Study Com Commission's recommendations uh, really created a much more thoughtful policy than this bill, I think, as it passed the original committee in the, in the House originally, it was an unworkable bill. I think that became clear to many of you at the public hearing, and you're now trying to make it workable. So we support that process. We want to help you make it workable in case it does pass so that it is, is a, as good a policy as we can make it. But currently, it's very far from, from what we believe would be ideal legalization policy. So. And did you follow along with the amendment as proposed by? I did. So the biggest thing that I see uh, is that uh, while it does clarify that the ACCs could apply for adult use licenses, it does not authorize us to convert to for-profit businesses. So essentially what you would be doing if this passed, as I understand it, uh, would be inviting uh, it, if, well, it would, be, would have been 15 cultivators under the bill if it's not amended, if it's amended to unlimited licenses. Either way, you're going to be saying for-profit companies are welcome to establish in New Hampshire, and ATCs, yes, you can compete for, with them, but you have to remain a nonprofit, and therefore you won't be able to access capital, and you will be operating at a massive disadvantage. So we think that's fundamentally unfair uh, if the ATCs aren't able to compete on a level playing field against these new businesses uh, I, I don't understand how we could support that. It's just not fair. Mr. Chair, just, just to respond to that, that was yes. not the intent. The intent was for you to have a parallel for-profit license um, and apply so um, and be able to use the same facilities so without having to re recreate the wheel, so to speak. So I did talk to An Anthony about that. He's trying to clean that language up over in OLS, but the intention was to have you uh, to be able to get a parallel for-profit license to be able to use your cultivation facilities to sell to the state for what you're growing. Okay. I appreciate that. I have no idea how it would work, and that's the kind of thing I'm we'd have to talk to. I'm with you on that, but just... Wait, wait, wait. Can I just, we got to clean that up a little second, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. So you said license, but but we're talking about incorporation, that they want to incorporate as a for-profit. Is that in the language? So again, the the intention would be just like following any of the other lang any other provisions under the licenses that are granted here, they would just have to form a corporation that's for-profit and be able to apply for a license and, and state, and we'd be allowing, so let me if I can finish, we'd be yeah. allowing basically that their current facilities could be used for both the not-for-profit and for-profit services. My understanding, Mr. Chair, yeah. Mr. Chair, is that we had a bill, there was a bill, right, that didn't make it through to do that, correct? Senate Bill 38 uh, was vetoed last year. It was vetoed, right. Two yeah. votes short of the override right. in the House. Right. Yeah. So, so it passed, uh, it passed the House and the Senate, Senate and the House, whatever, whatever, yeah, Senate and House. Correct. But the governor vetoed it, okay. 
So, so again, that's another. So again, one this isn't the retail here. side. So we're not letting them sell. We're letting them cultivate, manufacture, and transport to the state on a for-profit basis. Okay, Representative Nunes. Uh, and uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And to add to that, I think there are other discussions that are going on with the other processes that are okay with that, but we'll see when we get there on that. Um, I want to switch gears for just a moment, if I can, and, okay. um, and ask Mr. Simon, thank you so much for being here, because I think that your knowledge is, is the wealth that we're looking for. Um, um, Mr. Simon, would you please explain to the committee about vaping cartridges, about vaping, and how it comes from flour and or concentrate and or because you, I know that you have a lot of information about this. And I think this is confusing when we talk about vaping. Uh, people don't know that you can put the flour inside a pen and it, it, it heats it up and then you take in the vape. Yeah. So that's just like, it's, it's better for you, I think, than smoking a joint. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm a little crass. I apologize. Uh, but could you, could you explain that just a little bit for us? Uh, yeah, are you talking about whole flower vaping? Is that what you mean? Uh, differentiating that between, when we usually talk about vaping, and certainly in the context of nicotine, people are, are uh, familiar with the e-cigarettes. They have little heating elements, batteries. They heat the chamber. The liquid is heated. You inhale the vapor. It's uh, healthier than smoking because there's no tar. There's no carbon monoxide. Uh, the other byproducts of combustion are not present, so it's a cleaner product. Uh, the same sorts of uh, vape cartridges are made using cannabis oil, and you'll see those pretty commonly in the, in the marketplace. And uh, frankly, there are unregulated hemp-derived uh, THC vapes that you can buy in any vape shop in New Hampshire, and they're psychoactive, and I think they should be part of this discussion about how we regulate cannabis, and so far they haven't been. But people are very familiar with the idea that oil is, is in cartridges. But people also, as, as the representative suggests, uh, vape the whole flower which can be done by grinding it up and putting it in essentially there are these different types of vaporizers that have different types of heating elements. Some of them have fans, some of them don't. But the whole point is it heats the flour up to a temperature that is below the point of combustion. It releases the cannabinoids. You're able to inhale the THC and the other cannabinoids without tar carbon monoxide. And that's something that a lot of our patients at Prime uh, is how they prefer to consume flour. But as far as this bill goes, that would all be under flour whether it's used, uh, smoked, whether it's vaporized in, in the manner I just described, or if somebody buys flour and makes their own edibles out of it or something like that, it would all be under that same category. Follow-up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the follow-up. Uh, Mr. Simon, the, do, do, do the ATCs consider concentrates such, such as those other types of vaping materials also part of the flour industry? <laughs> Is that an easy enough question, or is that too convoluted? <laughs> uh, I mean, generally, the way we look at it is pretty much tracks with how our regulators look at it. Uh, and, and our regulators have a category called cannabis-infused products. And that is a broad category that, it, that encompasses all of, all, all of the infused products. So there's flour, and then there's in CIP, cannabis-infused products. So if this is going to move forward, I would suggest that some of the definitions in, in, in the amendment or the bill need to be adjusted to match the existing therapeutic cannabis program. For example, the word medical isn't in, in the medical cannabis bill. It is a therapeutic cannabis bill. Uh, patients don't use cannabis for medical use. They use it for therapeutic use. Uh, it is a written certification, not a prescription. Things like that would need to be trued up to the existing policy. So edibles is not in the same box as let's say the uh, vaping and other edibles is something you put in your mouth and you chew yeah most people would agree with you i'm just saying that under our rules of the therapeutic cannabis program cannabis infused products include edibles and also include vape cartridges because they're all infused. <laughs> Mr. So Chair, could yes. I just add, Mr. Simon, if you wouldn't mind, shoot me an email with some of the sure. definition things that'll clean up some of the language, and I'll look at that and see if we can integrate it into the bill, into the amendment. Okay. Certainly. Further comments or questions? No, I think. Then, then Representative Bronner. 
followed, okay. by, and followed by Representative Tucker. So, I don't know if you saw the list I have. So we had edibles and, injecti and ingestibles, which in some state includes uh, sodas, mm -hmm. things yeah. like that. Malted. So, sodas. And yeah, so and, yeah. and soda. Malted and all sorts of things. Right, right. And some states have it in beer, with, but I think the I know sure we were studying this in the in the commission that was beer, and I, we said no, make sure it doesn't go into beer. Although in this case with the liquor commission, it makes sense. But but so we got pre rolls. So pre rolls, how popular is that getting? Well, I, I, not not just so, not necessarily in your 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 world, but the recreational world. Yeah. So those are the kinds of questions that I would ask our CEO and, and COO. They could give us exact numbers if we wanted them, what they are in our market, and I could tell you what they are in other markets. But I'm I'm not a I'm not a marketplace okay. expert. Right. I'm not a grower, and I'm not a you know I'm, I'm the PR guy and the lobbyist. And I I've been all through the facilities. I've asked a million questions, but there's right. a lot that I don't know. Okay. Uh, so this is a, the only accessories that would be. That would be outside of this. The, they, the, the stores would sell accessories, but they would get from other kind of manufacturers. So right. that's a very small percentage. Topicals, that's the ointments mm -hmm. that, that absorb through the skin, and that's a very small percentage. Flour, is the, and then cartridges we just talked about, and concentrates. So concentrates, the dabbing stuff, right? You take its waxes, you put it in this mm -hmm. heating device, and it's, you want to you explain how that works? Uh, you probably do a better job than I can on that. Sure. <laughs> um, so yeah, the the most potent forms of cannabis that are available to consumers are concentrates. Uh, they, you know, they're readily available in in the Massachusetts and Maine markets. You'll see them with THC concentrations uh, in, into the 90 percentile okay. and, and above. And and the appeal of these products is, you know, as opposed to if you're a regular consumer of cannabis and you have a high tolerance. You don't want to smoke a whole joint every time you're going to get looking for the effect that you're looking for. Uh, if I make the analogy to beer, you wouldn't want to drink 12 beers if it took you 12 beers to get the buzz that you want. So some people prefer to sip bourbon. It's healthier because there are fewer carbs and less, less impurities. You're, you're getting the pure substance. So the way these products work, you, you either... Uh, there are a variety of devices that will reach the desired temperature. You take a small amount of the concentrate, touch it to the device, and it releases the vapor that you then inhale. And the appeal is that it's uh, more pure and, and uh, achieves the effect very quickly without uh, the impurities and the smoke involved with uh, smoking. No follow-up. No, well... She had oh, I do have another yeah. question. Though. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I have a question about um, with with the products that are sold, either through the nonprofits or just in general. Are there any labeling requirements that are placed on these products, with so far as um, how they might affect somebody's blood pressure or uh, interfere with any other medications they may be taking, or? pregnancy or any of that, any kind of lab labeling requirements that you have to deal with? Yes. So the Department of Health and Human Services has adopted detailed rules. Uh, all of our products are required to be independently lab testing, lab tested uh, for the potency, uh, the cannabinoid profile. So all of the labels include the cannabinoid profiles, how much THC, how much CBD, how much CBN, how much CBG, things like that. It's also independently lab tested for impurities including microbials, uh, heavy metals, pesticides. It's one of the major marketplace concerns when you have unregulated cannabis. And frankly, the biggest issue in Maine is that while they are requiring independent lab testing for their adult use market, they have this robust caregiver-driven medical market where independent lab testing is optional. So it's one of the concerns that we have. It's one of the reasons Maine medical cannabis is so much cheaper is they don't have that requirement. So a lot of New Hampshire patients are going to Maine for the cheaper products. But the labels minimally have all of the cannabinoids and certifies that it does not have the, the impurities, that it passed the testing on that. Now, broad, more broadly to your question, we've uh, worked with our regulators and with the Medical Oversight Board. We've developed educational materials on, on questions such as... Uh, uh, cannabis use while breastfeeding, cannabis use during pregnancy, 
cannabis use by minors, uh, any other issue that is important, because we understand that our patients are very often beginning with a very low knowledge level. In many cases, they've never tried cannabis. They're coming to us for help to, to, to use it and get the effects that they want. And they're not looking to get uh, stoned for the most part. They're looking to feel better, and we want to help them do that and make sure they're aware of any potential negatives. So we have a lot of educational materials that are geared toward that, and we encourage every patient that registers uh, to come in for a consultation, especially if they're not familiar to ca with cannabis, to sit down with one of our staff members, talk about what their goals are, what they hope to achieve through their cannabis use, and what products uh, and, and what regimen might be most beneficial for them. Okay, so can I? Representative Brown. So, oh, you have, okay. so here's my, here's what I, I'm still not certain about. Edibles, I'm just gonna use this from, I got this from Flow Hub. 18% um, was edibles and injectables. But then down the bottom we have 26% of cartridges. And then we have 14% as concentrates that we just talked, now that we've kind of defined the terms. And then flour was 33%. And then, then it was from minor, for the pre-rolls was 7%. So I'm assuming that it, you're vertically integrated, correct? Yes. So you, you do the growing, you, have, you do the manufacturing and all. So which is probably a better business model than we're talking about here because you kind of make, not that you're a pro-profit, but it is, it cascades down and, you, and, and, and let's, even in the recreational markets that are, a lot of those are, are vertically integrated, they make money at each step of the way. Here, we're gonna have private companies make it, they have to make a profit for growing and the manufacturers, which, and I have one more question to manufacturers, but manufacturers, they're gonna make some money along the way. So if we're just to retail, we're not gonna make as much, much money as if we were vertically integrated. We're not even, we can't even consider that because that policy is set, that it's just gonna be retail, we're gonna private enterprise for the other two. So um, my concern is how, how are we gonna track manufacturers I say, I'm not sure if we're gonna sell in the stores from the current, the, the policy language that was given to us. Um, we're, technically, we're not doing edibles and injectables other than people, the way the bill stands right now without our corrections, edibles and injectables uh, and, and ingestibles. <laughs> okay. are, I was gonna say, I'm not aware of any injectable. No, 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 Inge ingestibles, <laughs> ingestibles. It's, Edibles, edibles, and I don't know. That's the, then that's just the, the phraseology that's used in the market. I didn't come up with this. I just well, because they're drinks too. I guess that's ingesting. You know. Anyway. Right. So, so does that mean that um, the, uh, that pre pre rolls again? That's the service. I mean, if it's that's clearly, I guess we consider that part of loose. If it's a convenience service to do pre-rolls, and it's a, that's fine. But we would need a manufacturer to do that, right? Uh, unless we think the, our, our, our stores are gonna do that in the back room somewhere. Uh, topicals, that's definitely a manufacturing thing. Right. Cartridges is a manufacturing thing, and concentrates is a concentrate, because they're, they're extracting the, whatever they need to create these concentrates. So, mm -hmm. What? So are we gonna say to manufacturers, yes, concentrates are gonna be sold, and cartridges are gonna be sold, and pre-rolls are gonna be sold, and topicals are gonna be sold in our, in our state-run stores, or are we not? You know, is, huh? The manufacturing has to happen in New Hampshire. You can't import the stuff, technically. So I, I don't want to confuse matters, but if if we say no to that, how are we going to track? How are we going to track? If 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 we are going to sell these products in our stores, then we need manufacturers to do that. Mm -hmm. So how do we attract manufacturers if if we're not going to do edibles and ingestibles, and, and, and not the other things? No, 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 no. Yeah. You, I think you, you know it's saying. a good question, and it is certainly confusing that every state seems to have a slightly different system of classifying what is an infused product versus an edible versus something else. Um, but 
any way you slice it, there will be a need for manufacturers to produce all, all of these products. I think pre-rolls could be done by cultivators if the rules are sufficient. That's really easy. It's just a, an extension of trimming. So you can't give us an answer to that, right? I'm, I'm not entirely sure what the precise question was, but I, agree, I, would, I would agree that it's complicated and I can't give you a, okay. a final uh, answer. <laughs> something we can just dis discuss further on Monday. Right. What I, else I, do we have? I just think we need to define these terms as to what's in and out. Yeah, let, me, let me comment on that if I may. What's that? And really the point, what I want to say is to agree with you, yeah. Representative Romney, we really need a clear definition of what's in or out. And looking through this bill, I don't find it. I don't find a clear definition. Um, and uh, it's pretty important given what, uh, given how it plays out in terms of the state's revenue. So it's directly implicated into our job here. So. Representative Lang, you, in your amendment, do you have a definition of it? So I was just looking at that, Mr. Chair, and the only thing that I, I, I'm trying to see how they're using the definition, but it just on, on page two, section uh, line 31, it says cannabis products means concentrated cannabis products and cannabis products that are compromised of cannabis. That makes sense. And in other ingredients are intended for use or consumption, such as, but not limited to, edible products, ointments, and tinctures. That's right. yeah. So, so that's the one. That, I was looking at that too. I can't find in the bill, and maybe I'm blind here, or too tired uh, from, from yesterday and the day before, but uh, I can't find the prohibition. Yeah, give me one second, I'm trying to find it. So the interesting part, the only thing I see is on page three, starting around, um, when it talks about possession limit, it says cannabis infused products containing THC purchased from a retail cannabis store, which is defined as a state owned store, shall be limited to medical use only, for which the purchaser presents documentation permitting the use of cannabis for medical purposes. So that cannabis infused products, which Again, I don't see a direct definition of. So that's probably if we have cleanup language, it's right there. Because I don't see anything that says cannabis. The only thing it talks about is cannabis products. Under On page two and then three is where it limits cannabis infused products to be sold for medical customers only. Turn your mic oh, on. I've done it again. Uh, what I would suggest is that uh, you start with the section in the bill that uh, commands the Liquor Commission to sell cannabis and clarify that command with reference to a definition or definitions. It could be uh, cannabis and you stop there, but then you've got a definition of cannabis that covers it or you could say shall sell cannabis but not including and then you limit limit it mm -hmm. that way but um, either way it's got to be clear and maybe the lack of definition and clarity tells us that uh, we've got a free hand here because I'm not seeing it come across my plate here as, as clean as it's been suggested it is. That's clear. That's a good point. I'll go through it and see what I can find and adapt accordingly. Yeah. Okay. Appreciate Rubs that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, uh, on on page two, section seven, uh, there's there is the definition of cannabis. It, it says cannabis means all the part of the plants, the genus cannabis, whether growing or not, the seeds thereof, the resin extracted from any part of the plant, and every compound, manufacture, salt, derivative, mixture, or preparation of the plant, its seeds, or its resin, including cannabis concentrate. It shall not include 
hemp fiber produced from the stalks, oil or cake made from the seeds of the plant, sterilized seed of the plant that is incapable of germination, or the weight of any other ingredient compounded, combined with cannabis to prepare topical or oral administrations, food, drink, or other product. That's part of what we're talking about. Uh, I think it gives us a start and, and then a few more, maybe if, uh, maybe I think you're going to send a, a, a definitions over to Tim, right? If we can combine that with the definitions, we'll probably be able to come up with something. Good. And as long as he touches all those kind of things, kind of <coughs> things. And then, right. But it does impact the revenue, and it, it, this all is pertinent because it does, it does equal revenue. Yep. If we eliminate concentrates, that's less revenue. <coughs> okay. <laughs> Representative Hackenfeld. Okay. Anybody else? Questions for Mr. Simons? Thank you. Thank you. Anything else uh, we need to take with us? Can they start banking to speak for one minute since they've been patiently sitting back there? Oh, Christy, do you? Do you just want to just spend a minute since you've been sitting back there so patiently? I don't, we'll see if she can. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Christy Merrill with New Hampshire Bankers, and with me is Ryan Hale. Um, and just to be clear, we are we are neutral on the policy of whether or not to legalize marijuana, but um, we are just available as a resource to answer any questions. Um, Representative Lang was kind enough to take suggested language from us in terms of protective language for bankers um, who would like to uh, bank a state-run cannabis operation. So you're okay with his amendment? relative to bank yes it, it looks very similar i will just want to just double check that but it looks very similar to the language that we provided so that was per our uh, recommendation questions and, and this was this was approved by your association board is that correct this was approved by your board of yes it was of whatever your structure is yeah yes questions thank you you're very welcome thank you so, so banking goes out. <laughs> well, state bank goes out. The state bank. And the state bank goes out. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else we want to bring with us for the weekend? If not, then we will meet again Monday at 10 o'clock. And the first thing is to take <clears throat> is to take care of House Bill 1584. Rep Representative Aaron and Representative Schamberg are going to come up with another amendment. Yeah, would you get in touch with him? Okay. And tell him I. Yeah. Can you turn your mic on? I said maybe if one of the reasons that cannabis is, uh, has to be grown in New Hampshire is that New Hampshire has a agricultural uh, presence and brand, uh, maybe just a little bit of money eventually can be go to the fairs from the sale of in the future. Thank you. Representative Almy. Yeah, I just wanted to ask if um, Representative Lang could take a stab at adding into the definition wherever it is of a approved growing facility that it would be within a hoop frame, a indoor, uh, an indoor environment. Because I think it it is just about impossible to guarantee quality unless we have huge numbers of extension agents helping. Yeah. Mr. Simon. I'm sorry, I forgot to address this when I was sitting here before, but I think I can shed some 
some light on this. So currently the New Hampshire ATCs are required to be fully indoors. Every product is grown under the lights. That is the most expensive way to grow cannabis. It's also the best way to grow high quality flour. Uh, I was in Maine last week. I talked to the owner of a company that has a medical cannabis dispensary and is also wholesaling into the adult use. Uh, they have a greenhouse for their medical facility. They have a greenhouse for their adult use. This enables them to produce a much uh, cheaper uh, co product, but everything has to be independently lab tested. And that is how, from a regulatory perspective, you guarantee quality to the end consumer. Now, they don't have that requirement on the medical side, but they absolutely do on the adult use side. Uh, Vermont similarly wanted to make it as possible, as, as easily as possible for small scale cultivators to participate. They've, they've adopted unlimited licensing. Uh, they have six cultivation tiers, including a, a very small tier that they designed to be very accessible. And the way they did that is by requiring everything that is sold to be independently lab tested. Whether you're the biggest grower or the small grower, smallest grower, you have to go through the same testing requirements before the products can be sold. So typically the best products, the best flour will be trimmed and sold as flour. Everything else will be become trim used to produce oils, to produce infused products, and that is how there's a secondary market for the, the flour that isn't the very best. So some percentage will always be grown indoors. It'll be the high-end flour, but you can make costs go down quite a bit. And frankly, if neighboring states are allowed to grow outdoors and New Hampshire cultivators are not allowed to grow outdoors, even in greenhouses, that would be a substantial market disadvantage for New Hampshire. So all of these products are either grown indoors or they're te all of them tested in labs? They're all independently lab tested, tested in every adult use market that I'm aware of and, and in every medical market except for Maine's. Uh, it's standard to have independent uh, required lab testing for all products and we think that's just smart policy. Thank you. And have Whether it's indoor or out. It's in the bill? Yeah, there's testing. There's testing. There's licenses testing in the bill. I don't think it's I don't think there's a clear licenses. mandate that all products be tested. Right. I don't see that in it's the bill. Not in there. There's really a lot left to imagination and, and the liquor commission will surely do it this way, but I don't see a lot of requirements that are usually in bills like this. It, is it in our costs? I don't think the liquor commission understands these things very well yet. Is it in I, I believe that, if I may, Mr. Chairman, the Liquor Commission talked specifically in here today to testing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Mr. Chair, I, I think that they I are aware this. that it needs to be done. Yeah. Yeah. I can close this argument. Again, if you look under, on page five, where it talks about the regulation of cannabis, it starts, and if you go to number 10, require that part of the rule making things they have to do the requirements for the testing of cannabis so it's a mandate oh, for it's on page six so it follows page on six. to page six on line 12 so again as part of the regulatory requirements and and the rule making requirements of the agency they have to create rules for the requirements for the testing of cannabis right Yes. Thank you for that. And if I may clarify, it does not require that all cannabis be independently lab tested. It authorizes uh, the Liquor Commission to, to make create rules that, that, rule that may that. require it. Right. I'll, I'll agree with that. It's a big difference. You fix that. Again, if we want to, f if that's the will of the committee, is to say that in in instead of putting it in rulemaking and telling them they have to create it, I can put in there that says. Uh, create rules that says test that that testing will be done of all cannabis, and then they'll create the rules around that. I'm sorry. Like independently laboratory testing. Well, there's a testing there's a testing license in here, so the facility has to like if they want to if they want to be a certified testing facility, they have to get a license. So what I can do is under that number ten, just change that to say that they'll make rules or regulations requiring the testing of all cannabis, if that meets the requirements of the committee. Yeah. Uh, Representative Bromney. Yeah, I'm at. Um, when you mentioned Vermont's tiers, so they, they have seven tiers, but they also have, uh, is there licenses tiered that way in terms of make small farmer, less fee per year to have a license, is that it, it's your yeah, knowledge? Absolutely, yeah, it's six, six cultivation tiers, six and, tiers. and uh, the license fees vary dramatically from the tiers. 
Uh, furthermore, each licensee in Vermont can get each type of license, but you can only get one. So you can become vertically integrated if you apply for a cultivator license, a manufacturer license, and a retail license, but they limited all of those license types so that nobody can get one, more than one to limit corporate consolidation, et cetera. Okay, thank you. Okay. Just one um, more question about Vermont. We're gonna shut I this place down yet. by quarter of. So go ahead. Yeah, I don't think Vermont has started yet. They're still Correct. approving it. Yes, they finalized the rules. They've just opened the initial application period, but they have approved and finalized all the rules. The legislature just signed off on them last week, I believe. So most of the details are known. Any other questions? Thank you. We'll see you on Monday. Thank you very much. Representative thank you, Mr. Simon, and, and to the folks in the back of the room, thank you for being here. Problems if we add that in. Uh, in, 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 in.